Okay, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. So uh, we're going to be a little bit fluid about this um, because uh, I think there may be um, people here for, for different things. So um, just as an example, I had a request to move the complete streets plan um, earlier in the agenda. So I'd like to move that um, up till right uh, to item basically six and a half or right after the Montpelier High School students present. Um, are there, uh, mm, one consideration was we were maybe gonna move the consent agenda until after the uh, Scribner hearing. Um, but if it's short, then maybe we can just do it and get it done. I wanted to pull one item from the consent agenda, but I'm happy to bump that till the end. That's fine, let's do that. Um, we'll vote on that afterwards. Um, okay, I think, I think we're just gonna get right into it then. Um, so with that, that, I think that's our only change. Did you have anything else? No, I just you to make sure the agenda gets approved, nobody's. Okay, so um, without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, so uh, next is general business and appearances. This is a time for anyone from the public to make a comment about something that is not on our agenda. Anybody like to make a comment about? Yes, yeah, if you would come up um, and say your name and your street. And uh, our, our group norm is that you try to keep it to two minutes or less, oh if you would. God, Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Kate Harrington. Hello, hello. Is this good? Um, my name is Kate Harrington, and I'm a 20 year resident of Montpelier. Um, <clears throat> No matter the differences of the places we come from, we each have in common that we come from the same home, the earth. I'm sure each of us feels not indifference, but rather a deep love for home, the place that gives us food and drink and the splendor of beauty. We owe much to the earth and her extraordinary web of life. As this council considers plastic pollution and what actions might be taken to mitigate its harmful effects, please remember we're talking about our home. Um, a spokesman for a marine conservation nonprofit recently said, nothing that is used for less than five minutes should pollute our environment for centuries. I'm sure you would agree, and I urge you to go forward with plans for a ban on single-use plastics. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. So I just wanna clarify, I think uh, plastic bags is an item that is going to be discussed soon, so that is um, more or less on our agenda, so if you, other people have comments on that, we can save that um, till it comes up. Right, any other uh, comments on uh, topics that are not on our agenda? Okay, moving on. Uh, so we're gonna uh, go to the consent agenda. Um, is there a motion about that? Uh, Rosie. I would like to pull item G for further discussion and stick that at the end of the agenda tonight. Um, I move that we approve the consent agenda, less item G. I'll second. Okay, and further discussion. Um, I want to make a couple comments. Uh, one is uh, items uh, K and L are about purchases of uh, uh, equipment, vehicles, and uh, one of the things that I want to make sure that we do going on into the future is that when we put out bids uh, for vehicles that we are prioritizing uh, non-fossil fuel based uh, vehicles if we can, if such are available. It's very likely that for these kinds of uh, vehicles there might not be something that would uh, do the job that um, you know had some kind of alternative to uh, fossil fuels and that's fine but I, I would like to just make sure that we are consistent about um, uh, making sure that we are at least asking for that uh, going forward. So I'm happy to uh, 
you know, support this as it is, but just a note for the future. And then the, the second thing um, is that, you know, as we uh, are about to p potentially uh, re-up our contract with Good Taste Catering, uh, one of the things that we've had some council discussion about is um, the possibility of uh, setting kind of some kind of standards for ourselves about a, a living wage. And are, are the people that the city is contracting with, are they providing a living wage? Uh, for uh, their employees and uh, don't necessarily want to hold this contract up right now, but this is a good example of the kind of contract that um, I think we might want to consider uh, applying this to um, once we have a policy in place. We don't have that policy quite exactly right now. So again, happy to support it. Let's talk about this more in the future. This is, that would be a good, um, uh, venue to have that conversation. And they, I, I know they have an industry standard that they're paying their people according to. Um, you know, there's some logic that's based on, it's fine, but let's keep talking about this. All right, I'm done talking. Other, further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so that passes. Um, all right, so we are going to uh, go to this, the uh, hearing for the uh, Scribner Street length, width, and classification. Uh, so I want to be a little clear about what we are doing here. Uh, this is not a regular portion of the council meeting. Um, this is a, the Warren Public Hearing in accordance with Title 19 VSA. Uh, section 708 to consider resur the resurveying um, and the classification of Scribner Street. Um, as a formal hearing, the council will receive written and oral testimony to help determine the true bounds of this public highway, the, the question of the city uh, acceptance of Scribner Street as a public highway is stipulated based on uninterrupted public use and the lengthy history of city maintenance. So it's I've got to be a little formal about this because it's, uh, it's, again, it's a little different. This is a, a quasi-judicial uh, uh, meeting. Uh, so the council can ask factual questions at any time. Uh, just any note to those who are giving testimony, please stay on point. We have a very long meeting. Um, so no duplicate testimony, um, if you would. Uh, because this is a quasi-judicial quasi -judicial process, uh, counselors should refrain from expressing what they are thinking uh, while we're in public session here. Um, and we'll talk about what you do think uh, when we go into deliberative session um, at a later point, which will not be tonight. Uh, and uh, the city has retained Paul Gillies, and who's here to assist the council to help us keep on track through this process. <laughs> I was actually going to suggest Paul could come up and take my seat, and I can. That way, he's. That would be great. Perfect. <laughs> For those who don't know, Paul Gillis, longtime municipal attorney, and. Take bills. Uh, why don't you come up in my seat? So you can be right here no. to help the mayor and everyone else, and I'll. Okay. I'm not that active in this hearing, so. So I believe the first order of business is for us to swear in all of the, those who want to testify. Uh, and uh, that could be uh, interested parties um, uh, just in, in general. So I guess I would ask, well, and John, I think you're, you're the notary here, so I might ask you to do the swearing in, because I am not a notary. Oh, uh, you know, I would actually defer to Jack, who knows the proper way to swear in folks under such Okay. Such sure. So I would invite anyone who uh, intends to testify uh, to present evidence to uh, stand, and, and then I'll give it to you, Jack. Okay. Anyone who's going to be a witness, uh, stand and raise your right hand. You solemnly affirm, subject to the pains and penalties of perjury, that the testimony you are going to give in these proceedings will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Do. Okay. There's a sign-in sheet for everybody So did everybody who signed in, or signed, you know, saying that they wanted to testify, everyone got sworn in just now? Yes, I mean, there's six, and I know who they are, too. Where's the sign-in sheet? It's oh, it's right, right here. Okay. Okay. Maggie and Bruce, Mark and Sarah and Tom. Okay, so the first... Uh, 
order of business is uh, for the Public Works Department to uh, present their evidence and testify. So I'm going to turn it over to Tom. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm Tom McArdle, Director of Public Works. Um, there, it's far. way far away. That's the table thing. Back so just drag them over. You could grab the other one as well. There are two. That, one yeah, that one's good. Yeah. It's live. <laughs> Try again. Tom McArdle, Director of Public Works. We presented a uh, background cover uh, sheet for our council agenda cover sheet for uh, this hearing proceeding. Well, turn to the microphone, please. You're trying to give evidence. Not really uh, entertainment either. I know. I'm sorry. You can sit closer. We can we can move it too. So we uh, we convened a site visit at the uh, Ott Scribner Street. Um, reviewed um, the site and the lay of the land. Um, discussed uh, a number of things. Got oriented in the property, um, which is part of the proceedings of the um, laying out of a street and the. Um, when this was brought to our attention, uh, it was a matter of uh, questions about property lines and um, the boundaries of, of the public highway right-of-way. Um, it was determined that we did not have a record um, of the official action of the acceptance of the street. And from that, I um, conducted my own research and then um, Retain the services of Lisa Gannett, um, who's here tonight. She's a registered land surveyor in the state of Vermont. Um, Lisa had conducted some other, uh, done some other work on the street, is familiar with, um, with the property, had surveyed the, the Margaret Neal property, um, has a background in um, uh, this type of work and known as ancient roads. Um, I also consulted with attorney uh, Paul Gillies. Appreciate your attendance here tonight, provided uh, Great deal of guidance on how to go about this this hearing and how to resolve this um, problem, which is not that uncommon in New England. Um, poorly defined streets in excess of 100 years old, um, lack of title. Uh, this portion of town actually was uh, part of the town of Berlin until uh, legis legislative action in 19 1898. Officially became uh, part of Montpelier in 1899. Um, unknown at the time whether or not Scribner Street actually um, was part of the town of Berlin at the time and the city acquired all its rights and titles to the streets when, when Berlin was annexed. Um, so I'll move into the um, reference to the statute. Um, this is a survey of the existing highway where no previous survey had, has been properly recorded or the record of a previous survey has not been preserved or the termination and boundaries of a previous survey cannot be determined. All of those are true in this case. Um, I'll go into the exhibits that I presented to City Council. I have uh, them here. You also were, uh, City Council was also provided them as uh, uh, electronically. Uh, they are available online for the public to view as well. Um, so I First uh, prepared a memorandum to the City Council in, in April, and uh, the City Council heard this, uh, received a briefing on the 25th, um, and we talked about the absence of an official acceptance. Um, th tonight, the City Council was asked to consider the historic evidence of acceptance dedication by the City through continuous and, and uninterrupted care and maintenance by its Department of Public Works. In light of the lack of action, uh, evidence of, of official action, including documentation of a certificate of completion, a deed, um, a petition um, acted on for laying out of, of a highway, uh, we are left with the only remaining remedy uh, to us being 19 BSA, Section uh, 33. Um, the evidence will show that Scribner Street has been considered to be a public highway and has been treated as such since uh, the late 1800s. The public has had clear and unobstructed use, and property owners have relied on it for access since that time. 
In recognizing Scribner Street as a public highway, the City Council was asked to f affirm this point by formal action in order that a survey be conducted, which will be recorded with your findings of fact and conclusions, which Attorney Gillies will prepare for you um, based on your, your deliberative session. You are also asked to determine its classification as defined by statute. Uh, it's Title 19, subsection 302. By definition, the improved portion of a street is Class 3. And any portion uh, of an unimproved road, the length beyond the improved portion, would be considered a Class 4. There is another classification known as a trail. Um, the primary remaining question is length and width, because we, I believe we've established that, that it is a public highway through use, acceptance, and dedication. Although not absolutely conclusive, the weight of the evidence will show that the street is 340 feet in length. You will hear testimony and receive evidence that the street is 24 rods in length uh, at 396 feet. The improved portion of the street is about 314 feet, but this is not the length of the right-of-way. The width of the right-of-way is less certain as per the evidence. In this case, we have looked at the best possible fit given the monuments and evidence of record, the actual needs of the city for maintenance and consist consistency with the neighboring properties. Um, Taplin Street, I refer to them as the sister streets, um, Nearby is Taplin Street and laid out about the same time, we believe, at 33 feet wide and Blackwell Street at 40 feet, 40 feet wide. I have those two, I sometimes mix them up. Uh, Ms. Gannett will explain the layouts considered and why the width of 40 feet makes the most practical sense with the least impact on properties while respecting and guided by historic boundaries. Um, I will now um, describe the, the exhibits and have them entered into um, the evidence uh, or, or um, for evidence for for review by City Council. So they're all labeled. I have 15 exhibits. Exhibit one is a is a memorandum, background uh, dated 419. This was provided as information to assist with an understanding of the ma matter at hand. Um, exhibit two is a second revised report by. Um, uh, Lisa Kennett, registered land surveyor. She pre prepared preliminary reports. This is her um, uh, revised and updated report based on additional research. And a physical survey will be presented as Exhibit 15. Um, in accordance, uh, well, this first was a notice of City Council is Exhibit 3 um, regarding the, the April 25th meeting. Um, by statute, I was required to submit notices to all interested parties, um, and I affirm that I sent notice of these, this hearing by certified mail to interested parties. I also received, um, um, I contacted their respective utility companies and um, have written record from them that um, they have no uh, concerns, uh, that they were duly notified. Um, the public notice of this hearing was published in the Times Argus, this is Exhibit 5, and as required, this is evidence of public notice of uh, public be noticed, which was published in a local newspaper of general circulation. Exhibit 6 is a survey of property belonging to Margaret Neal, um, conducted by Sunwise Surveying, which is Lisa Gannett's uh, company, um, which is dated July 2001. I had a question on the date of that. Um, Exhibit 7, a survey of a portion of land owned by James and Deborah Pienaard by Gregory Dubois. Um, this property now owned by Enelrad LLC, joining the southerly end of Scribner Street. Note that neither exhibit number 7 or uh, 6 or 7 illustrate the length or width of the street. Um, exhibit 8 is an email from Bruce Sargent, a resident of 8 Scribner Street. Uh, contains a list of pertinent records relevant as evidence to the public acceptance and activities that have t taken place um, on the street that uh, is evidence that the city has um, accepted and maintained the street for all these years. Exhibit 9 is a city of Montpelier Street plan by Percy Smith dated 1921. It's considered to be an official highway map of city streets and contains a, notion, a notation about street acceptance which uh, asked Lisa to discuss um, about with measured length, and they, that is uh, behind me. Uh, I believe that's the blue one. Um, exhibit 10 is also a, a official city street plan. 
1932 by J.J. Pine, considered to be an official highway map, and also containing a notice, notation about the street acceptance. Um, number 11 is uh, another Montpelier Street pay, Plan, 1932 through 40, last revived, 1947 by J.J. Pine. Um, exhibits 9 through 10 are considered as the greatest evidence that Scribner Street was indeed accepted and its length was known when these maps were created. Um, also of interest are uh, exhibits 12 and 15, uh, 13, which are Sanborn maps. These were created for fire insurance rating purposes. They have detailed information about buildings, such as building materials, whether they're wood or brick, in the city's water system. Um, they're interesting maps, but they're presented as exhibits because it, Scribner Street is illustrated with a municipal water main and shown to be unlike other city streets on their maps. Um, exhibit 14 is an uh, email from Bruce Sargent dated March 8, 1918 uh, to myself. Contains references to street commissioner reports which were commonly presented to city council to explain expenditures. Again, evidence of municipal acceptance and, and uh, dedication. Just to I believe yes. you misspoke and the email was dated 2018 and not 1918. I'm s terribly sorry. Yes. <laughs> I don't think I was there to receive that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm listening. Um, exhibit 15 is a survey of Scribner Street, um, dated June 2018 by Sunwise uh, Surveying, file number A18514. There's four maps. These are the various widths. Um, that the council is asked to consider. Again, Lisa will refer to those, um, and they are draft surveys of uh, the width and length. So I'll conclude by saying, in my opinion, Scribner Street should be surveyed and laid out at 30, 340 feet in length with a width of 40 feet in alignment um, with existing monumentation found along the existing street as shown, and that it be uh, considered a class three street for the improved portion any length beyond the improved portion would be considered class four. Any questions or the exhibits or? Do you have a quick question? Ashley. Um, um, should we go to Lisa to describe the exhibits in more detail? Sure. So I, first, a, a question for you, Attorney Gillies. Uh, are the rules of evidence relaxed in these proceedings or? I, Modestly. Just, okay. okay. <laughs> I do think we need to accept. Yes, I think you need to have, but the we do that proper first? thing would be to ask if there's any other party who have objections to the material. Okay, so uh, any parties are with objections to the uh, submission of that evidence? Okay, so we're going to accept uh, and acknowledge that evidence, those exhibits. And uh, Ashley. And with uh, assuming for a minute that we were to accept the 340 with the with the designation of the unimproved portion as a class four, what, if any, maintenance or repairs would need to be made to that additional unimproved section if we designated it as a class four as opposed to a trail? So class four is uh, unimproved and there is no municipal obligation to maintain or change any of the status of it. We do not plow it. Um, it's, it's an optional if the city wishes to, to maintain it. Uh, it could be improved at a later date and reclassified. Mm -hmm. So essentially it's status quo um, and no obligation to change the status quo by statute. And that would be if it were a class four. What if it were a trail? Uh, trail is, um, I don't know an awful lot about trails, except that it's uh, limited to um, use for access. Um, not it, it can be other access besides motor vehicle. Okay. And let's uh, assume for a minute that we, the council decides that it will be accepted at 396 feet. Would, would that analysis stay the same as in the improved portion remains as is, and then the remainder back to whatever, whatever the, foot, the footage we decide would Correct. be a class four or a trail? That's correct. You notice at the site visit there was a drainage structure beyond the end of the improved portion. Um, it's important that that drainage system and the maintenance of that be included in the, um, which the 340 feet does, and certainly the 396 would do that as well. That would all be unimproved portion beyond that. Okay. Uh, so I guess we'll go to, to Lisa. Yeah. Now, do you have different evidence, or are you just talking about the same evidence? I'm going to talk a little bit about why there is no width available on this okay. road. All right, thank you. And it just 
from my own point of view, I started this survey. Okay, I started this survey for Margaret Neal last year. Um, we essentially did the research on all the parcels except for the GMT Associates parcel, which didn't have anything to do with what we were surveying. Um, we looked at the Greg Dubois survey for Pinard that wraps around this area. Um, and it, one of the things that is clear is that the first lot out of the east side of Scribner Street was the Staples and Gomez lot. It was never owned by, um, by Scribner. It was not owned by, um, by John Doucette, who owned a lot of the land in the area. That lot is originally deeded out as having four rods on River Street and eight rods on Scribner Street. They also call for the two southerly monuments of that lot to be um, granite bounds. Those granite bounds were not found, but I'm suspecting that when they dug for the little garage here, they replaced those bounds with pins. They're in the right position. They are the right distance apart. So on the basis of those two pins is kind of how Greg Dubois came about a lot of his survey with a tie-in to uh, various properties over on the, um, on the Taplin Street side of things. So. I was really asked originally to survey Margaret Neal's property. I did a lot of the work to locate these other monuments because I needed to figure out how things lay in here. Um, so we have another two lots that were deeded out um, by John Doucette or various later people, and that created the Martineau and the Neal properties. Both of them are called for as eight rods along Scribner Street, and that's how we come up with the 396 feet um, that would be called for if all of these three lots stacked up and they were all along Scribner Street. Um, the only thing I'm going to say about it is that Doucette, who deeded to the Enelrad LLC, um, Margaret Neal, Martineau, and Enelrad all came out of the same chain of title. Now, um, John Doucette, when he bought this land, didn't own right down to River Street. He owns a 14 or so acre piece back here. When the piece got conveyed into Neal, he calls for this entire eight rods to be along Scribner Street, but when he deeds further lands, when he deeds his land forward, he never discusses Scribner Street at all. Um, there's no mention of any street in that deed at all, in none of them. Okay. Um, GMT Associates, now remember that I often had to go back to the town of Berlin to fill in my deeds um, because Scribner deeded to John Doucette. It was still Berlin. The GMT Associates and the Staples and Gomez piece came from somebody named George Scott, who was not part of the John Doucette deeds. Um, so when I looked at GMT Associates, hoping once again that I could find something that showed me where the other edge of this street was, uh, there, there wasn't anything. They gave a description. They start on a, a line where it hits River Street. They go along River Street until they come to something that they called Slaughterhouse Road. Then they went along Slaughterhouse Road to Doucette's line, along Doucette's line. So there's no distances given here. So there's no way to come from some other boundary and pull onto the other side of the street. Um, that is why there's no that's why we can decide what width of street to put on there. Um, I like the concept of holding the monuments that are out there already for along the east edge of the street and whatever width is decided to hold those monuments. They've been there, they're established, everybody's lived with them for a while now. I don't, I can't remember the date of the Du Bois survey, but clearly the, um, 
the original pins for Staples and Gomez have been there at least since 1907, if not before. So uh, I favor holding that. If we go for the full uh, 49 and a half uh, foot, being a three rod width, that are standard roads, you're going to knock lines like right through the edge of, of porches and the front edge of houses on the west side of the street being the NLRAD and the GMT Associates side of the street. Um, after looking at things, and, and let's, let me say this as well, there's no monuments of anything on this other side of the street. Nothing in the ground to mark the line between NLRAD and GMT Associates. That's not really my issue. Um, it would be hard to prove because of the lack of distance calls in the GMT Associates deed. Um, all they have is an area call, uh, which is fairly weak. So I like the 40 foot. It gives enough room for the street. It also leaves the apple trees that are on the GMT Associates parcel on their side of the new line of the street. Um, I have got a couple of different drawings prepared if people want to look at the other possibilities for width. Uh, obviously, you could do the full three rods. You could center the 40 feet on the street, but then you'd be leaving a strange gap between the monumentation and where the new street line is going to be. Not impossible to deal with, but maybe not that favorable. So. The okay. oh. survey also on Exhibit 15 shows the 340 and the 396 yes. and the finished yeah. rods, so you can see that. Yeah. All right, any questions from the council? And, uh, I guess, Ashley. Um, so, I, so assuming we go with the 40-foot width, um, that would still mean that there would be access to all properties on Scribner Street from the public highway. Yes. Correct. Um, the frontage of the uh, Neal property, um, I don't know exactly what that is. If you could scale that off. The frontage? Uh, the, yeah, the full width of their frontage is 132 feet. The 340, what is the frontage to the 340 line, that length? Um, well, it would from, be 56. From, from here to here. Okay, it would be 130. Yeah, I'll just scale it. It's probably the easiest one to scale 30. Okay, to the 40 foot line, you would have somewhere around 75 feet. So all properties would have frontage on a public street for access for driveways. It would allow for the widening of a driveway there if, if they so desired. Um, much of what we're, we're basing this is on um, highway maps that were submitted to the state of Vermont for um, um, call-outs to um, when streets began to be laid out. The state um, wanted to inventory all public streets, and that began I'm not sure the year, maybe Paul knows, but the um, towns had to attest to their actual roads um, and began submitting maps. And every year this council is asked in February to, to send in a certificate of highway mileage and you attest to the true measure of your highways. Um, and that primary purpose for that is for financial state aid. The town receives um, aid for um, class one, class two, and three roads for maintenance that we do. Um, no, no funding for class four portions of roads or trails. Um, so that's the primary purpose of, of, of submitting official maps. Um, typically not your key evidence as, as what is actually the record. Typically you submit the record to the state of how you acquired a road and then that then becomes the measured distance. Um, there was a little something that odd that happened over the years um, in those measured lengths. Um, it was done by feet. Um, at some point, I think in the maybe 60s, they went to decimal miles. Um, that led to some confusion in the record. Uh, this 340 feet um, works out to 0 0.06 miles. Um, as actually 0 0.064 miles will give you the 340. They rounded down, giving us 0 .06, which is 316 feet or 317. And that's been the record for quite some time, um, merely from a rounding error. There was no um, 
uh, questioning of that as far as the state aid goes. Um, eventually everything balances out. Some are rounded up, some are rounded down. Presumably the state aid is the same. But feet matters when we look at this and what that record might be, what the council actually attests to um, for its length. And it has contributed to the confusion of what the true length of this street is. It's 0 .064 miles or 340 feet by the records that were submitted to the state. Okay, so at this point, um, if you were one of the interested parties who was sworn in, um, this is an opportunity for you to ask questions of uh, Mr. McArdle or Ms. Gannett. No questions? Yes. If you wouldn't mind coming up to the microphone, I'll also just introduce yourself. I'm Sarah Field. I just have one question. Is a little, I heard your, uh, your I heard your testimony. Is this on? I heard your testimony about um, the different lengths, and from the 340 and the additional 56 feet, did you find any evidence of any highway maintenance, of any town maintenance, of any portion beyond the 340? Have they ever plowed it? Have they ever put pipes through it? Has there ever been any kind of use by the public of that portion from the records? Um. Perhaps Bruce uh, Sargent can address that as well, but from the recent past, recent, more recent history, um, that has not, if anything did occur back then, that has not been, that has not continued in, in the last 40 or 50 years that I know of. Um, so that would be discontinuous um, maintenance of, of the street. So at some point that was not, that was not continued. Okay. Um, Thank you. That's all I, that's great. Sure. Uh, yes, Bruce. Um, just a quick question. Uh, I think on your survey that was posted uh, this week, there was mention. Okay. There was mention of a um, finding that Maggie's deed of uh, 396 was based on a, a fraudulent transaction or conveyance. That uh, so I'm confused by what I read. No. That's why I wanted to check. No. Because what I'm looking at here is clear evidence from 1990, 1915 that the street was built almost up to the pine, paved. And so when John Doucette sold that property four years later, there was a street there. At least by the evidence well, of Well, there may have been a street there, Bruce, but there was never any dedication of that street to the city. John Doucette never conveyed any rights to the city for the street. So someone can say, I mean, the lot size is not going to change, but the fact that he calls it along the street does not then suddenly make that a street. He did not sell those. He never conveyed those rights. Neither John Doucette or George Scott in the front ever conveyed any rights to that street to the city. I think I, think I understand that. So, so the, there's nothing fraudulent except that he called it a street and there is no certainty. It, there may have been a road there, but <laughs> what I'm saying there is there was there. not a street listed to the town. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll work on it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's not uncommon. We have other streets. I refer to them as paper streets. They're streets that were intended in a subdivision to have been conveyed, but never actually were. Um, so it's not, it was a anticipation, expectation that there would be an acceptance. Oh, this is paving. It, it may have been used as a street, but what was actually accepted is the question here. And what does the city council believe is the uh, appropriate um, true length of the street or establish what that length should be? Okay, any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you, both. Do they have evidence to submit? Well, that is the question. So at this point, um, uh, other interested parties can uh, submit testimony. Um, and I think we have a sign-up sheet right there, but it is a little far away from me. I'm wondering if someone could <laughs> like grab that sign-up sheet and uh, throw it my direction. Thank you so much. Do you want to sit at the table? Okay. Uh, so uh, next up would be uh, Sarah Field, if you wanted to present any testimony. Um, I, 
I guess the only testimony I want to present is after reading all the research and um, listening to this uh, presentation tonight, the, uh, the, we feel that the street is appropriately at least 316 feet. Probably um, there's good evidence that it could be 340. That the the NRADs do not dispute that either way, but that we feel that there it does not go beyond that. There's no evidence in the record. There's no evidence historically for that roadway ever being longer than at most 340 feet. Okay, thank you, uh, Mark. I don't know how to say your last name, Magier. Magier, do you, would you like to offer anything? I'd be an echo of her, okay. so no. Okay, thank you. Um, Maggie Neal, would you like to offer any evidence? And uh, if you would, uh, if, you if the answer is yes, you should come up to the microphone or the, or the table. Sure, why don't you sit here? I'm glad that um, my driveway doesn't seem to be impinged by this discussion. Uh, the fact that my deed seems irrelevant, I mean, it was brought to Tom and um, he kind of put it off. It's the only deed that I have on this piece of land and it says along Scribner Street. So I was going along with that. Um, and the neighbor that I shared the land with for 17 years uh, felt that the stream was the boundary, so we just had this uh, kindly assumption that um, we owned to the, to the stream. So when it was uprooted and blocked, it was alarming. And then to find out when we asked the length of the street, there wasn't really a length of the street, but um, we were told that it was point zero six zero, which put it below my driveway, um, south of my drive, <laughs> north of my driveway. <laughs> um, it was upsetting. So speaking from the heart here, um, this this has been very uncomfortable, and I know that. You know, it's not all written in stone and that we're trying to correct it now. So personally, I'm very glad to hear that 340 is a number that's being spoken by both of you up here because it was not the number that I was hearing uh, in the past. Um, it's, it's been my privilege to care for that wild piece of land up there and to have, um, the edge of the wilderness so near this capital city that I have worked very hard to keep the art uh, vibrant in the town as much as possible. So I guess I would like to appeal to the council to <laughs> um, at least do the 340. And I do understand how there's not much evidence that there was a road. I think there is evidence, but I do understand that if it wasn't accepted by the city, that it was just a, you know, a, a little local road that belonged to those people that lived here on the top of Scribner Hill. All of them uh, were French Canadians coming down, working in the granite sheds. And I think that's, I've really been happy to have learned a little history about this place where I live. So there are some, some benefits to having this problem because I got to learn more. Well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> uh, Jack? Before you, before you leave, uh, Ms. Neal, could you hold, I, I have a question for you if Excuse I could. Excuse me, Jack. Um, it's okay. <laughs> um, it was very useful to me to uh, go out and view the property. And, uh, and the question I have for you is, do you think there's any, there would be any negative effect to you if uh, the line were set at uh, 340 instead of 396, keeping in mind that it doesn't change the boundaries of the, uh, of the lot that you're deeded? Um, yes, thank you, Jack. Um, I think that's a good question. 
It is a very waterful piece of land, and therefore, all the years that go back in history, a lovely stream that came down, and that held a lot of the water. Now, the city put in two French drains, one at my driveway and one up at a probably 350, 360, um, back in the late 1980s. Um, the city council and the workers of the town came up and resolved that situation in the backyards of the homes there. So I like that the city was taking care of the property. I do think that if you let water uh, not be channeled properly, it can be very destructive to the land. My son is in California, he's an environmentalist, and that's one thing he's really worried about, that um, it doesn't have a real channel now. So, yes. <laughs> and, and are these French drains uh, located in the area where you think the road should be, or are they lo located right on your property? The French property? drains run to the stream, but the upper one has just kind of, it's come to the top of the ground, and basically it isn't there anymore. But my other son has dug uh, channels just to get the, the water from the hill over to the stream, but now the stream is not um, a stream anymore. <laughs> but they're within your lot? Yes. Okay, thanks. Yes. Uh, Ashley. Um, piggybacking on that, do, do, do any of those things on the property fall in the width or the length of the question that we're being asked tonight? Any of the things on so the, the property? So the French the drain, drains, about. or yes. I think there was one yes. other. The first French drain does fall um, just uh, past the driveway and goes down to the storm drain that's there, and it's within the 340 feet. And is it also, it's it's also within the? It's right in the middle of the Right street, in the middle, so okay. Yes. Yes. And the yes. second one, is that both, with, depending on the 340 or the <laughs> 396, um, does that second one fall in the length of? It falls at 350 or 360. Okay. It is past the 340 mark laid by the city. And does, would that also be encompassed in the width question if we were to go with either the 40 or the 49? Is that right? No, it's know? further, it's beyond the street, so. It's, I, I did not see that second French drain, so it's not located on here. Okay. I can't answer Can I have the that question. Microphone. It, it was uh, Jim Kinnard that was talking about it, so he's the one that refreshed my memory that that happened. It was, and he would be here tonight, except he said it was just going to be too difficult to watch the conflict, <laughs> witness the conflict on his land. Well, we're hoping, yeah, before, hoping to resolve the conflict. That's right. I, I, I want you all to know that my, my hope is that we will be wrapping this up at around 8, which we are within eyeshot of now. Okay. I just want you to, I'm going to put that out there. I'm not going to hold us to it, but I just want, to, want you all to know. Okay. Good to have boundaries. Yes. <laughs> Pardon the pun. Um, the, I'm not familiar with the second drain. I am familiar with the storm drainage work that was done on Scribner Street. There's a lot of drainage that was affecting both private properties and, and the public street. And uh, water is the enemy, especially for public roads. Um, I'm not, I don't know about the one further up the street. Um, but as far as whether or not they will be encompassed by this, um, the holding of the line along the westerly, um, easterly uh, side of the street, um, whether it's 49 or the other, that would, as you can see from the site visit, how far back they are, 14 roughly down in front of their house and way up. So those would fall within that boundary. However, those, are, those serve a private purpose. There are many private connections of drains to public systems, so that doesn't necessarily mean the city would be responsible for maintenance of those. Um, although, if the record shows that they were done to protect the city street, certainly that's of, of interest to the city and, and public works, and we would, um, we would participate to the extent we can. Um, so I think anything by the side of that, uh, it could very well be, but again, I don't know where that upper drain is. Um, a question, perhaps, if you don't mind, uh, uh, Mayor Watson, is if I could ask uh, 
Attorney Gillis, um, as a survey or resurvey under the statute, um, there is there a question of uh, this street if it is it's shown to be 340 feet by acceptance and dedication over time, and City Council chooses to go to 396 feet where the evidence is less um, does, doesn't carry quite the weight. Um, is there a possibility that um, that could be considered a new taking and uh, damages might have to be paid for acquisition? How would that be um, resolved if that were to be questioned? Well, if we start with the assumption that the only evidence of acceptance is at 340, then to go beyond 340 to 396 would be to lay out a new highway and it would be a taking. Okay. And there would be an argument that a compensation should be paid or should at least be discussed. Thank you. Okay. Thank but you. I don't think you have warned a laying out hearing tonight. You're just resurveying. Okay. I have in my notes that Scrivener Street was recorded and accepted by City Council at 397 in 1919. So at some point it was accepted. Now you're going to ask me where that is, and I never saw. Yeah, if you have. I've never saw it. No. Do you know? If you have that evidence, I suggest you. Yeah. Submit if, that if for, that's a, yeah. for review. If they, I believe it was accepted. Well, uh, so I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you, Bruce. Sorry, because uh, I just want to make sure that we are okay. um, done with Maggie. And yes. then uh, and you're next on the list, Bruce. So if you have evidence that you would like to submit, now is the time. In answering the question. Also, do you want to just say your full name for? Uh, it's my understanding that well, Scribner Street <laughs> at 396, <laughs> because that was implicit in the Maggie's original deed, it was dedicated at that distance. Otherwise, how could you sell the property? Uh, and then it was accepted by maintenance from uh, 1907 to 1920. So that that was my understanding. I don't know if that. You know, I really, with the, the, the case down in southern Vermont, I'm not sure anymore what the, I think it's uh, very difficult to have an implicit dedication and uh, uh, acceptance become law now. True. So it has, it's become very strict. And I don't know if those conditions on, on Scribner Street meet those new strict uh, conditions or not. So do you have a set of In any case, I, I, let me launch. Uh, I'm very excited to present evidence on this because I think evidence is the thing that will answer a lot of different questions. Uh, this is a picture of the number uh, eight house from 19... Oh, here. Oh, oh. Thanks, um, and and the, the house is photographed with, with the residents there. On the right is Susie Ber, uh, Bertoli. She, she lived at, in that house. Her father ran a, a boarding house on Taplin Street. Down here was Alexander Berganti. He was a, a relative at Berganti, the first purchaser of the number eight house. So there's a lot of information in the picture. But for me, what's very exciting is you can see Scribner Street behind the gang. And it's paved. And if you do a little math, because the, the house is 19 feet wide, so there's one known in that. If you do a little math, you realize that pictured here is a paved Scribner Street up to almost 340 feet. It's six feet short of that. Now, this street is going somewhere, and I would say it's probably going to the shed that was on the uh, 1915 map of uh, the Sanborn map. So that puts Scribner Street paved at 365, probably. So um, anyway, I, I think I, I'm excited to add photographs to uh, the project that you're doing. Uh, and I think it will help because 
to actually be able to see what is happening. Bruce, did, was that part of the evidence that you already uh, it's, submitted? It's, it's Exhibit 7. So exhibit 7. Let me just seven. go over the exhibits really okay. quickly. So, so uh, I'll wax eloquent to one if I don't uh, okay. uh, get, get going on this. Bruce, real uh, The first exhibit is uh, uh, analysis by our uh, attorney, Richard Brock, and uh, which is uh, describes the, um, the acceptance of, 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 of uh, Maggie's deed from 1995 up to the time time now. Um, he would have been here personally, but he, he, he feels that like, he doesn't hear well enough anymore. Because uh, uh, we did definitely beg him, <laughs> but he wouldn't do it. Um, but he did ask us to deliver one message to you. He wanted uh, uh, this report to, to go to Mr. Gillis. Uh, that was very important to him. Uh, the exhibit two is a copy of the Ward 6 cens census, February 1, 1899. It shows the beginning of Scribner Street uh, listing the people that live there. Uh, exhibit three was a photograph dated uh, July 1919 showing the Pioneer Bridge in the power plant in the neighborhood. Um, there's uh, exhibit four. Um, no, this is all listed. Is that the email? And I'm excited that you're going to see it. So let me get to what I want to really say about this. And this is probably from conversations I had with Mr. Bob. So, and Bruce, I just... Uh, the, the email, it's very brief. I just want to clarify. So, is it your intent right now to introduce everything that had been sent out to us earlier that was in that list? So, you're moving to admit all of that. I earlier by PDF. Yes. I, I've got a, a set of copies for uh, the, the so attorney here. So, you don't necessarily need to submit it in writing or, or oh. to give us all these copies because we already have it okay. electronically. Um, but I appreciate that. It's very nice. Um, I'm happy to give it. <laughs> so, uh, and so you have hard copies we have that. Way. Yes. And, and, it, and, and it's, um, anyway, but there's they have to be, they have to be, have to be submitted. Let me get to the whole point of what I would we'll really accept like them to soon. say here. Uh, and it, it came a little bit from, from Mr. Brock. So I think there's, what, what are the overriding public interests here? Justice for one or all? Or windfall profits for few? It's really no more complicated than that. In February, when I offered to give evidence to survey to Mr. Gillies, he pointed out to me that I was free to give evidence, but the surveyor was free to ignore the evidence that I brought. And I understood. I would like to point out to counsel that the surveyor can advise you. Mr. Gillies can advise you. And you are free to ignore that advice. They will not bear the responsibility of decision. You will bear the responsibility of decision in the decision you make. Therefore, that decision is absolutely and entirely yours. I would encourage you to read and breathe in the Vermont's seventh article in the Constitution. The government is or ought to be instituted for the common benefit, protection and security of people, nations, or community, and not for the particular moment or advantage of any single person, family, or set of persons who are a part of that community. And that community hath an, an indubitable, unalienable, and one of my favorite words, indefeasible right to reform or alter government in such manner as shall be uh, that the community judged most conducive to public will. That's a big responsibility, and you gotta do it on your own. Uh, you have the own, you have, you and only you have the indefeasible right to decision in this matter. Godspeed. Thank you so much, Bruce. Uh, is there any objection to the acceptance of this evidence? No. All right, so we are going to uh, uh, acknowledge and accept the evidence that uh, Bruce submitted. Thank you so much. You can. You don't. <laughs> so, I mean, we've, we've brought it, right? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Okay, did you, uh, any other questions that you Nothing have? Nothing further to add. Okay, so everyone understands that uh, this was your opportunity to submit evidence and there's nothing further to submit. Okay, great. Uh, so from here, the council is going to set a, a date to uh, go into deliberative session uh, and we have 60 days to come out with a, uh, a decision. We'll do that in writing. We won't necessarily have a, a meeting to announce that, but we'll issue a writ written decision about this within 60 days. Um, and let's set the date for the deliberative session la later on in the evening. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, okay. I'm. Well, uh, we'll officially close this evidentiary hearing, and we're going to go back into regular, a regular council meeting. Okay. Phew. Thank you all. All right. So, moving right along. Oh, and we're at 801. That is excellent. What's that? You're so great. <laughs> Maybe I should tell people their ending times ahead of time all the time. All right, so we have some presentations from uh, Montpelier High School students. I'm so excited to hear what you have to say. Um, <laughs> I think everybody knows I'm a teacher. Well, maybe having a pop physics quiz, right? Yeah, that's right. There's a physics test at the end. Only no, if it's just Harry kidding. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I'm going to turn things over to uh, Heather McLean, who is a teacher at Montpelier High School. What's that? Yeah, sure. So my name is Heather McLean and I teach social studies at Montpelier High School and the students have been working for a couple weeks on researching some local issues that matter to them and they presented, they created some nice presentations that aren't working with the projector so I have to warn you, especially the first group had created their presentation on an online platform and so they're going to do their best to present without that and we did print out some statistics for you, but they might have to sort of shuffle through because they weren't, they weren't planning to give you those. So um, it will just be a little bit. Do you want to try my laptop? We could take like a two minute break. I could use a break after that anyway. Sure. Should we We're take two break. minutes and see if we can get my computer to work? We get tech gurus here. A plastic bag ban. Okay, two things. One, there's a microphone that works. Oh yeah, you gotta get really close to it. That's number one. Number two, you should also say your names. Alright, I'm Aiden Murphy. Is that better? And pass the microphone around as you're, as you're doing that. Um, I'm Mia Preston. I'm Quinn Mills. I'm Cypress Levitt. Um, so the basic problem is that single-use plastic is one of the main causes of most of our environmental problems today. The average American family takes home over 1,500 plastic bags per year, and only 1% of those bags ever end up getting returned for recycling. Um, many marine animals, such as sea turtles, mistake plastic bags for food, and scientists believe that um, about half of the sea turtle population has already ingested plastic. Plastic is not only dangerous for animals, it is also dangerous for humans. Um, when plastic debris floats through the oceans, it releases toxic chemicals such as PCB that can cause cancer. Yeah. Um, plastic bags are only used for an average of 12 minutes, but they can take up to 500 years to disintegrate in a landfill. So some of the constraints about having a plastic bag ban would be things like the alternative would, if the alternative is paper bags, then paper bags, the process for making them is not much better than what um, plastic bags do for the environment. And it's um, having to use canvas bags can also be rather costly for families and um, it just can create hardship. Um, so we sent out a survey to the school, MHS, and um, asked a bunch of questions. And one of the more important questions was, um, how much do you uh, or uh, do you really care about the plastic bag ban, and would it 
affect you. And about 76% of the people um, care about it and they would be affected in a positive way. And 94% um, of those people know about the effects plastic bags have on the environment. So they know what they're somewhat talking about. Um, so we are asking the council to pass a plastic bag ban in Montpelier. Great. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, Rosie and then Connor. I think I heard you say you sent out the survey to the high school. Can you just tell us a little bit more about who, who your survey audience was? Uh, we sent it to the students and the staff, all students and the staff. Uh, Connor. What do you guys think about plastic straws? Do you like them? Should we ban those too, do you think? Or? They're poor for the environment as well. All right, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, Bill, do you think it's appropriate to talk about what, what our plans are from here? Uh, so we were, uh, in the background here, um, able to talk with our, our attorney briefly about uh, what this might mean. So just uh, super briefly, uh, in Vermont, w municipalities are not allowed to make just any laws, uh, any ordinances that we want to. We can only make uh, ordinances about things that the state has expressly given us permission to uh, make ordinances about. and. Uh, one of the ways that we, if we don't have the authority to um, make a, an ordinance about something, uh, is that we can basically give or ask for permission or give ourselves permission to make an ordinance like this uh, through a, a charter change. So at this point, we could make the case that uh, either as a, that, that plastic bags or straws uh, are a public nuisance uh, or that they affect the health and well-being of the public, but it's that would be a, a tricky link to make. Uh, so one possibility is that we could ask our lawyer to make that connection for us, but that would be kind of a, a heavy lift and it would take some time. Um, another possibility is that we could, uh, if the council is interested, um, we could uh, work on language for a charter change to ask for permission from the state uh, to al allow us to regulate things like plastic bags. Um, thumb scale, if this makes any sense. This is good? Okay, All right. Um, <laughs> so... Can I, yes, can I interject with a legal question? Yes. So wh what exact? I mean, I, I can't imagine it would just be like, a, we want to make a, a, an ordinance about plastic bags. What would that change look like that we would be requesting? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it actually could be pretty simple as that. It could be that the city, you know, in the charter enumerate certain authorities that the city council has. So adding it could be something like regulating plastic, you know, straws and bags <laughs> or, you know, something a little bit more better worded than that, but it, we, it would basically to give ourselves that authority. Um, you know, we looked at a lot of different angles. We talked to the League of Cities and Towns. We talked to some other communities. You know, Brattleboro has passed one of these, and they they used in their chart. Their charter gives them authority to regulate solid waste, which ours doesn't. Mm. And so they, they use that. But, you know, the counter argument to that is actually when you get handed a bag at the store, that's not solid waste. It's not solid waste to throw it in the right. trash. Right. So, you know, it's a it's a kind of a slippery slope. And we, we looked at a lot of different angles. And uh, what, uh, what our guy said was, you know, if you've got time, let's put together a good, well-written article and think it through and put it on for a charter change ballot. And then you have the community discussion. And um, so that was the advice is the safest way. So oh, did you have follow-up? I guess I would just, I would encourage, if, if we go that route, I would encourage that we not limit it to this one tiny thing because I think that there are other things that we might want to examine in the near future, like single-use plastics maybe, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's not saying that that's where we're at, but if it is something that we want to explore later rather than going through the same process again in 12, 18, 24 months, I think you can do it right. in one I could picture us uh, trying to find some overarching yes. language mm -hmm. that would 
be a little more general and also framing it in a way that is uh, that allows for the state to do whatever they want to do with, with single-use plastics uh, and that uh, maybe we want to go beyond whatever it is that they're uh, regulating. Does that make any sense? Yes. Okay. Um, so one possible timeline moving forward from here is uh, let's say the, the council is into this idea. Um, we could either direct city staff or create a committee to look at la uh, language for a charter change. Um, that could then potentially be ready for a vote as soon as, let's say, November. We, we are already anticipating that we may have some uh, a vote in November, so that could be on the ballot simultaneously. Um, if it's approved by the public, uh, on that ballot in November, then it would have to be approved by the legislature in the following session. Um, and it's after they approve it, then we could actually go back and uh, uh, you know, enact some kind of uh, an ordinance change. I would imagine that we'd also want to write the language of the ordinance that we would like to have sort of simultaneously to the charter change um, language as well. Um, so one possibility is that we could have a motion to direct city staff or the creation of a committee to create such language. Yes, Connor. I'd like to make that motion if possible. <laughs> I will second that motion. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? Yes, Jack. I think it might be useful to have some clarity as to what the motion actually is. <laughs> yes. And, and the things that I'm thinking of are plastic bags, plastic straws, and other single-use plastic items like uh, cups, cup lids, uh, takeout containers, um, not sure whatever else, but ha have it be fairly broad so that uh, as we draft, as we proceed to draft an ordinance, which I hope we will, that uh, we're not stuck with have, having the ordinance that we want to draft go farther than the charter change that we get approved. Would you care to clarify? I'd consider that a friendly amendment. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll have to review the video, but I can, I'll, I'll figure You'll it out. You'll figure it out? Well, maybe okay. it's, it's not so much an amendment as an, an explanation of intent. Sure. That's what I heard him say. It sounded like to me, but yeah, right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> we can go with it. Is, are we feeling clear enough about it, Donna? Do you have a question? Oh, oh, no, that's fine. We can vote on that. I had a question for the kids. No, go ahead. I think my, so. My takeaway is that we'll draft charter language and then perhaps a, a basic language. And you know, we have whether we choose to do the charter change in November or March, we have a sufficient length of time to talk through a lot of different right. options and. Uh, have community right. discussion. So I think it's, you know, I, I wouldn't be too directive at this point. It would be as we get into the, it and figure out where we want to end up. Okay. Uh, Donna, then Rosie, then Ashley. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would hope that staff would research other places that have done it, which was one of my questions for the students, whether in their research they actually found places that did it and what kind of language they used. No. Okay. Can, I, can I jump into, there are some representatives from the group, formerly uh, People Against Plastic Pollution, currently Citizens Against Plastic Pollution, it was renamed, um, and they've done some extensive research on this with other cities, so they may be a, a good asset working with the uh, city staff on this. Great, thank you. Uh, Rosie. So I'd like to be clear that I would like, I, I'm happy to um, direct staff to work on a charter change that would give us the authority to do this, but I feel like we haven't <laughs> fully investigated what are the impacts on everyone, um, you know, who does this affect and how does that affect them. Um, so I, I want to have that conversation um, and I think that we can as part of a discussion on that charter change. Um, so before we decide exactly what we're doing, um, I'm also interested in the idea of um, a ban versus, uh, you know, a tax or a fee for bags, um, and what does that look like? So, I want us to gain the authority to do this, but then be really deliberative in how we actually go about doing it. My so I agree. My hope is that um, actually by going the charter change route, it'll actually allow us some time to get lots of input from 
all the stakeholders. That's my hope anyway. So we should plan for that along the way as well. So thank you. Uh, Ashley. I don't need to speak. Oh, that was what you were going to say? It. Okay. Great. Any further? Yes. We did have a couple people from the group who had one minute sort of testimonies. Fabulous. And just wanted to give them a chance if they could, Mayor. It's okay. If, if they would like to speak, you necessary. sure may. Yep. <laughs> it's really, it's okay. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, what's your name? Uh, it's, my name is Joe Yoder, and uh, we've been, we formed a group a couple months ago called Citizens Against Plastic Pollution. Uh, it's just a few people in the neighborhood and that are just, we've, we've had it, we're fed up. You know, uh, there's so many, there's so much bad news out there about plastic. And uh, what, what we've been doing is uh, meeting and collating information, coming up with, with a better name. Uh, and I think what we're working on right now is kind of three things. One is, is to educate about the problem, ourselves and other people, hopefully. We've got a lot of information about it. There's all kinds of information about the plastic problem. And then educate regarding the solutions. And it's not just a law. There's a lot of solutions like passing out reusable bags. Uh, maybe businesses can sponsor them. I'm doing that with my business. Um, and then uh, we're, we're also interested in trying for a ban of single-use plastic bags and other things. So we're delighted to see what's happening here tonight. And uh, you've got a pep rally for you. <laughs> if, if, if this starts to head for a vote, we're, we're going to rally the forces for it, for sure. Great. Super. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, we have a motion um, that's been seconded. Uh, any further discussion? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Great. Thank you so much. Let, let the record show these four came in and can totally change That's this. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you I appreciate your, your work on this. We're going to point at you. All right, who is next? Don't we have the, we have the other high school project. Oh, you have a new projector. I've got a new projector. I figured There's a second high school group. You might want to try this one first. And just try and this there's a second first. high school group. Oh, I know. Okay. I don't know that Kevin knows that yet. So, Kevin, you know, there's more students to present. Oh, okay. Can yeah. you just try this one first because it might be working now? Maybe not yet. <coughs> they, okay. have a, they have a presentation. Yes, yeah. So, uh, um, I don't know your compatriot's name. Stu. Stu. There's more. There's more student presentations. So you're not quite next. Oh, we're not. Sorry. <laughs> I know you're. you're next, um, next. <laughs> yeah. No worries. All right. Who is next from Montpelier High School? Which is the work? No, it's a connection. It's a connection issue. Because yeah. there were a couple things that were knocked. All right. If you would. Uh, so did you find the microphone that works? Okay, great. So make sure you're passing that around, and if you would introduce yourselves. All right. Um, so my name is Nathan LaRosa, and this is Evan Rohan and Sydney Dunn. Um, we've been working on a project um, researching um, the rec center building and gym, and uh, we've all played basketball um, for the rec, and we sent out a survey to grades 5 through 12 in Montpelier and we got 147 responses to that and we also sent out a survey to the wider community for three days and got 37 responses from that. So after our research on this subject we believe that the building and the land should be sold so it can be invested into a new facility that prioritizes ADA accessibility along with allowing the community to democratically pick out key parts and priorities of a new facility. Um, on slide two, there is a graph, and that is from the survey that we sent out to both the community and the students. And 85% of them, roughly on both, um, had said that they had been to the rec center. Um, and on the next slide, um, 
37.4% of people said that they've only been to the rec center once or twice. 23.8% um, of people said that they go to the rec center seasonally for sports, and 18.4% of people have never been to the rec center. And this kind of goes to show that pe most people have been to the rec center but haven't particularly been enticed to go back. And we're kind of drawing the conclusion that that might be on because of the state of it, of it currently. So next on slide five, we ask the question of, do you feel like the rec center is in need of a renovation? And we got about 65% of people saying yes, that it is in need of a renovation. And this just shows how the student body and community understands that there needs to be a change in the current condition of the building. The next slide, uh, one being there are no importance to the rec and 10 meaning very important. You can see how almost everybody on both surveys believed that the rec is either important or very important to the Montpelier community. Can I interrupt you? I'm a little confused about one thing. Why are there two side-by-side -side okay. graphs? Um, so the Maybe one you said that and I just missed on it. The left, with the 147 responses was sent to the student body of MSMS and MHS and the one on the right was sent out through French Port Forums okay. Thank you. to the okay. community. Sorry, carry on. Thank you. Um, so in the slides before, you saw how around half the student body and community have either never went to the community, never went to the rec, or only have been once or twice. But if you go to the seventh slide, we asked the question, would you go more often if it was renovated? And we got almost the exact same number saying that they would want to go even more often to the rec. All right, so um, if you flip to the next page, um, it's just a little bit of an overview of some of our results. So we had um, 131 votes for an indoor pool, which would obviously require a new building. Um, 100 votes for a full-size basketball court, because the court at the rec currently um, is, I believe, regulation width, but it is um, much shorter than reg regulation length. Um, we had 86 votes um, for a new locker room, which, again, would probably require a new building. Um, and a couple more, uh, 79 votes for um, a table ga and games room, which is currently at the rec, and um, 74 votes for a renovated bathroom. Um, you can see the rest of the results on that page. Um, don't want to bore you to death with numbers, but we also interviewed the recreation director, um, Arnie McMullen, and he um, and we in our meeting um, were told about the feasibility plan that is currently um, in place and um, that ADA accessibility would be the main priority for renovation or a new building. Um, and the uh, building is the main priority of other recreation facilities, fields. Um, and Arnie said that there were 10 to 15,000 people that go in and out of the gym um, a year. And he also showed us to the Claremont um, rec building, which they had the decision whether to renovate an old building of similar age to ours or build a new one. And the renovations were um, expected to cost about $2 million. And the new facility um, ended up being built for $9 million. Um, they had, before the rebuild, they had a 23% recovery rate. And with the new building, they had a 61%. They almost tripled their recovery rate. And um, granted, they got a very, very large um, grant. They got a $3 million grant from their local bank. But they um, were actually saw very good financial benefit from building the new building. And um, there was a very peaked interest 
along with that. So if we go back to the slide, uh, we had a part that was specifically in the communal survey uh, about taxes. And so our first question was just simple. Would you be willing to pay higher taxes in order to pay for the rec center to be renovated or rebuilt? And we got almost 90% of people saying they'd possibly be up for it. But then we still had around 50% saying they would definitely commit to having higher taxes. And who was asked in this survey? Was this still students? This was just to the communal survey. Front porch yeah, forum. Yeah, this was just, just, to, just to adults. Because yes. you have it listed twice, so I assumed one was front porch. What was the other one? Yeah, the, the one with school. 147 responses is to the, the students. schools. But that's what I'm asking. The students don't pay taxes. No, so. well, so no they, they, they did not get that question. So on slide two, on the, the next question. No, is the different. next question is different. If you answered no, is the second one. Well, okay. okay, thank you. My mistake. Thank you. All right. Um, and on the next slide. Um, 78% of people showed interest if they did not want to pay higher taxes to pay a higher rate to use the gym. Currently, it's $1 for an open gym pass. For and resident. Or for resident um, uh, open gym pass. And um, 78, once again, 78% said that they would be willing to pay a higher rate to support the rec. Um, so kind of the conclusion that we've come to from the data is that most of the respondents feel like the rec center should be renovated or rebuilt, most of them saying that they think it should be rebuilt because of the amenities that they're asking for. Um, we feel like one of the top priorities for the rebuild is the building being ADA accessible because it's one of the last buildings in Montpelier, I believe, to not meet those codes um, and we feel like the what the community thinks is definitely um, the right direction to go in from our research that we've done and yeah thank you for hearing us thank you I have a quick question. Oh, sorry. Yes, Ashley. <laughs> um, so in your surveys or in your talks with um, the rec center director, did you kind of get an idea for who, like, who most often uses the facility, like by age or by resident, non-resident population or? Uh, we did not get a specific okay. number on that. No. But there also was um, Jump and Splash, which is a group of people who uh, did a survey to the community who got a thousand responses mm -hmm. who may have some information on that as well. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, guys. All right. Any other questions for this crew? Uh, yes, Glenn. Uh, a small question of curiosity. On slide five, I believe, do you feel the rec center should be renovated um, in the responses from the students? Apparently one person responded or some mm -hmm. People responded salad bar. Yes, there was there was an other option on that question um, to say whether it, you thought you know the gym floors needed to be or that stuff. Um, that was not a intended answer. To okay, this. thank you. <laughs> all right. Uh, so just so you all know, we are. Uh, looking at this this very question and uh, what we should do with it. So your, is your, I think I know what your recommendation is, but tell me one more time. What do you want us to do? Uh, plan a new facility while in selling the old building to use that money. Use that money. Continue to build a new one. So we're going to get some kind of a feasibility study back with lots more numbers and uh, well, we're going to go from there, but thank you for this input. This is very valuable. Um, I don't know what our timeline is on that decision, but... There's actually uh, the group's meeting on Friday to get the feasibility study out the door. Um, but yes, this is what council just set their priorities in dealing with this question as a high priority for this year. This is very helpful. Quite as definite as the plastic bags, but definitely <laughs> something we need to take on. So we appreciate your, your input on that. Thank you so much.
All right, and I think we have one more group, is that right? Okay. Um, Heather, would it be possible for you to like email us the present like any links to these presentations? That'd be great. Thank you so much. It's okay. Where, where is it? Take your time. You know we're not connecting to the present. Yeah, it's not working. To the yeah, we're oh, but they just want it to be able to see. Yeah. Oh, this is the worst. Okay. All right. Um. Okay. Are, are you all ready? You're getting there. Yeah. It's okay. No, no worries. <laughs> um, you should say your name. So stop. Uh, I'm, I'm Mason Eklund Gustafsson, and... Uh, we are a group of students uh, working Sorry, on... Sorry, you're not coming across at all. Maybe it's oh. the way you're holding it. So you should speak a little louder. And uh, and uh, how about the other folks? You can introduce themselves. <laughs> I'm Isaac Mandel Siever. I'm Kim Comas. Um, so first of all, thank you for having us. Uh, so as you know, we're students from Montpelier High School. And we've been working on a project for our Global Issues and Perspectives class that consists uh, of solving a problem in Montpelier that we think, we consider that it's important. So we thought um, there an indoors park or an indoors public space for all ages uh, would be a great idea, um, especially in the winter when it's too cold outside. And you just need it's too cold outside uh, for hanging out. Uh, during our research, we uh, found that there are currently uh, feasibility studies being performed for potential construction of a new re uh, rec center. Uh, this led us to, con to the conclusion that the best uh, that we can do is to attempt to provide a perspective of the students of this, of, uh, this school, a place where uh, most of these uh, viability studies feasibility studies will not likely reach. Uh, the city center used to be a place to hang out, but ever since it became more business oriented, students have been increasingly re uh, removed for loitering. Uh, currently, the only real option for students is the basement teen center, which is in this building, but unfortunately requires a sign up and often feels small and confined, uh, leading many to avoid using it. Um, yeah, so we did a survey uh, that we sent to all the students in Montpelier High School and also we did a survey that we sent to like the town and if you guys would want to see it, like sure. a few uh, examples and fun. This, that's um, to the town and that's to like the students. Okay, I'll look at it and pass it that way. Or, or, oh, they're both together. Okay. Like yeah. they're separate things. Two separate things. Two separate things. Uh, so after 50, we got uh, 53 answers from Montpelier High School students. And so we found out that 61.5% um, of the students of our school um, use the basement team center less than once a year or never. And then do students that re um, rarely use it, it's it's only at 25%. Um, also in the same survey, we found out that most of the students often find themselves without a place to hang out around town during the winter time. Um, and we got a 43.4% answer saying that um, they find themselves in this situation very often. And also we posted a survey in the front porch forum that I gave to you and for the general community and we got 43 responses. And, and when we asked if they would use a public space provide during the winter, 72% uh, replied yes and those who replied maybe were 25.6%. Uh, yeah. 
We proposed that this space be created as a part of the new uh, rec center. We attempted to contact other spaces such as the atrium on 79 Main Street, City Center, City Center, and the current rec center, but unfortunately they are not interested or not capable of renting their spaces at this time. Uh, this project is something that many students clearly desire as well as people throughout the community. Uh, the addition of a space like this to, uh, to this new building would be a, a large draw, encouraging more people to use uh, the facility. We know that this was something that was already being considered, though we thought that we could provide some more information and hopefully persuade you to keep this in mind throughout the, pro sorry, throughout the process of creating this new rec center. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Any questions? This crew. So, if I am understanding you correctly, there's there weren't any great obvious solutions at this point was that is that more or less true uh, yes or? we um, we contact we contact we email the um the city center to rent rent if they would be willing to rent it but they they are concerned about the noise because right. there's people living around and then we also can um email the space above the books there mm -hmm. Yeah, and they also said no because they're not they're not interested yep. in renting the place. So rec center is centers our only option. Uh, Ashley, did you reach out to other communities that have big or bigger rec centers or bigger teen centers? I should say than than ours because ours I agree is pretty small. Um, no, we did not. But uh, that was sorry. Uh, no, we did not. But that was. Um, what we were planning on doing. I don't think we ever got that. I suppose if we wanted to pursue that more, we could do right. something like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Donna, did you have I, w I haven't seen this survey. I just wondered if you mentioned about like what time of day, what days were yeah. wanted. Uh, we we didn't we didn't the, miss that mention that in the okay. survey. I don't think next time. The, <laughs> <laughs> The schedule would be the same as a park, mm -hmm. right? As the park? As a park, like a normal park, like it would be open all, like every day, I think. And like whatever the hours of Hubbard Park might be. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Well, I'm glad that you all looked into this because this is also, you know, something that I think, I mean, it seems like uh, the community does need something like this. Um, so I'm glad you uh, did some research into this and um, I want to keep keep this in mind let's I mean one of our goals is to increase the park space uh, for the city and uh, you know thinking about what does that mean for the winter time um, it's a great question so all right thank you all so very much uh, thank, you. And thank you Heather McLean for your support and all this uh, all right so I want to do a little um, Time, time check-in, uh, because uh, uh, we are just going to have to jettison something, right? Like, uh, so I want to keep it to the things that uh, are timely and, and essential right now. So I know uh, the complete streets is definitely going to be next, but that's a, a topic that we had put off um, from previous meetings. So I want to want to do that, but I also just want to put a bug in your ear that like we, we just got to keep moving forward <laughs> on this. Uh, so that's one do thing. Do we have the tax stabilization? I do. I, I, I'm hoping that the tax stabilization will not be a long conversation. Um, so I would like to keep that one, and I want to keep the um, uh, water resource recovery conversation. Um, but beyond that, well, park, oh, I, should we? I think I, we need to do the pocket park. We need park to do the pocket park, yes. So, Kevin, does um, the first time home buyer thing have to go tonight? Um, you can just approve it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, that was smooth. I mean, yeah, uh, you know, it's it's what's the strategic next plan meeting? does I mean, it's not timely in the sense that there are people waiting. My inclination is that that one might just have to wait. Uh, and there, um, I also anticipate that we were supposed to have a presentation from the Community Justice Center. That is one I think that we're going to have to put off as well as. I texted her. Let me just see. 
I would like to put that one off as well as the strategic plan. I might, I, like I have a couple notes about that. I might just add them to my council report at the end. Um, just my goal here team is that we are done by 10. Um, that's that's my, my target, which really tells us, you know, I'd love that for this portion of it to be 20 minutes if possible, and... Or less. Or less, 20 minutes or less for this. See you later. Okay, great. Does you, does you yeah. on now? That Rocket way? doctor. That's right, we gotta keep moving forward. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody. Kevin Casey, Community Development Specialist. I'm here with Stu Sirota from uh, Alta Planning and Design and Corey Line from the Department of Public Works. Um, the plan that's being presented tonight is a culmination of a number of years, it's approximately two years since we received a grant from um, the uh, a combination of VTRANS and um, Agency of Commerce and Community Development. It's called the Strong Communities Better Connections Grant, which provided $45,000 um, of the grant, and we matched it with $5,000. Um, the associated plan uh, is uh, to uh, was was actually a city council goal in 2016 uh, or 15, um, and so this was a uh, this was. Uh, applied for and we received the funding from ACCD and VTRANS. Um, and Stu uh, has stepped on um, in the last six months uh, from ALTA um, and kind of shepherded the project through the last uh, um, really three or four months um, and um, we're happy with what we've received. Thank you. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay with the microphone? Okay, great. I'm it's, glad you're here. It's, it's great to be here. I've, uh, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to make it last month, and I'm feeling great now, and uh, I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, as Kevin said, I'm Stu Sirota. Um, I'm with Alta Planning and Design, which is the firm uh, hired by the city to um, undertake the plan. Um, I, uh, I'm also Alta's um, Northeast Regional um, Director. I'm actually um, based in Baltimore. and. Um, as uh, Kevin said, I took, um, I took charge of the plan several months ago, and um, uh, this is my second trip to Montpelier, and I have to say I'm really enjoying your wonderful city. It's, uh, I am extremely um, smitten with it, and I hope to have more opportunities to uh, you know, come back and visit. But uh, we're here to talk about the plan, um, and to put things in uh, context, um, a lot of people are not familiar with the term complete streets. And you know, in our country, uh, we're very fond of buzzwords, and um, it, this term, complete streets, is something that really implies something. It really implies that we need to do something differently that we haven't been doing. And that you, you, you might think, well, how are our streets incomplete? Well, you know, for the last 50, 60 plus years in the country, there's been a culture and sort of a practice of building places around the car. Um, and um, these, two, um, these two images could really be anywhere. Fortunately, there's nothing like this, especially on the image on the left here in Montpelier. But this, could, this is a very, very common scene where most places and most streets and roads are really built with the car in mind um, and l really little else for other <coughs> modes, whether it's walking, biking, transit. And so there's, um, there's really been um, a movement um, for the last 10 or 15 years to really start thinking differently um, about these things. Even in a quaint, charming downtown like Montpelier, um, which is very walkable, sometimes we can still feel like the car is certainly king, right? Um, that, that, you know, streets are really made for the cars and it can be challenging at times to find room for, for other modes. And that's what this plan and that's what complete um, streets plans are really all about. 
this is just a quick sample um, from uh, other parts of the country. There's, uh, to, to date, there's over 2,000 and growing complete streets policies and plans that are in various um, stages right now. Um, the lower right-hand image, I think, is Burlington, actually. Um, so there's really a lot going on. People are very interested in this. But so, um, so uh, and here are some examples from um, other parts of the country where these sorts of transformations are starting to happen, where there are still, um, there is still plenty of room for cars and safe and efficient car movement. But these are places that are also welcoming and safe for bicyclists, uh, pedestrians, and also transit patrons. Um, so there are numerous benefits. I won't really um, spend time on, on any of this, but um, there are a really, um, there's a growing and large body of evidence and knowledge as to why um, doing this matters from a health benefit and a, um, a uh, you know, public health um, standpoint, from a sort of fiscal and from a uh, personal um, finance um, benefit and, and, and also social. Uh, um, there are many different um, social benefits. It's much safer and, uh, um, and people feel safer when traffic is not moving as, as fast and there are less crashes. So lots and lots of benefits of, of, of doing this sort of thing. So when we um, um, hit the ground running here, um, our team looked at many different aspects of Montpelier's um, street network. We looked at traffic volumes, we looked at um, speeds and also limits, we looked at um, both existing and planned bicycling infrastructure, we looked at the existing uh, transit network, and we also looked at land use and the actual uh, development patterns, where, where people are coming from and where they really need to, need to go. And all of that fed in, into, our, um, into our overall analysis. And from all of this, we came up with a, a street typology. And what does that mean? It means that there, as you can see on the map, every street in the city is color coded in one of the different seven street types. And what these are, this is really the heart and soul of the project, where, and don't expect people to read this at this uh, you know, scale, but this is, a, this is a, a, a chart that shows that there are these seven different types are, are, are grouped based on the different uh, characteristics and the different aspects of each of the um, different types uh, that you have here in the, in the city. And, and, and by grouping them, we can also start to look at how things can be looked at and changed um, over, over time, what kind of treatments can, can be done for each of these um, types. And so we've uh, very, very much um, cataloged the widths and the you know, lane widths and the right of ways and, and things that are sort of a um, optimal width and uh, things that are sort of the maximum um, recommended. And uh, down near the bottom of the table, that sort of bottom section shows the different uh, pedestrian and also bicycle treatments that I'm going to be um, talking about briefly here um, that would actually fit and which would be appropriate for each of these, each of these different types. So, um, and let me just back up for one second. One thing to you know, note about this table is that on the left-hand side, um, types one and, and, and two are the most um, sort of major roads, the ones that are, the ones that where uh, cars move the fastest and where the, there's the highest volumes. On the far right side, type six and seven tend to be the ones where there is the least. It's really the, the opposite. And in the middle, there's that fine, uh, you know, grade where you have more of the sort of urban environment in within the you know core where you would expect to see more people walking and more people biking. So, just to show um, some examples of each of the types, um, how you can see that the character of each of these goes from sort of major uh, thoroughfares to um, you know major roadways to more um, medium-sized roadways and then to the more local and even rural um, you know, streets. So if you take, uh, for example, I've uh, focused in on typology three, um, it, you can read down there and see for, for within that typology, that is the sort of aspirational um, um, uh, roadway uh, characteristics for uh, streets within that type. And, and towards the bottom, where, where those dots are, 
those are the different um, those are the different treatments that will, would be appropriate within that type. So what what are those actual treatments? I'm just going to highlight some of those. So these are things that we all know. Um, these are pretty um, standard things: uh, sidewalks and paved shoulders. Uh, and in the plan, there um, there is guidance on each of these uh, in uh, terms of the widths and um, the sort of guidance that where each of these um, should should be or sh or should not be based on the different types. Um, also, um, sort of uh, standard bike lanes. Um, but then we have something called advisory shoulders, which are still a rather new uh, type. It's still an experimental um, treatment um, sanctioned by the Federal Highway Administration right now. Um, it, it's really meant for local through roads where there's lower uh, traffic volumes. And it, it adds dashed lines. It sort of uh, you know, creates a shoulder for where uh, bikes can, can be, but, but cars, it, it, it really signals for uh, drivers when they see people on foot or on or on bikes that uh, they should they should yield. Um, and then once you start getting into roadway types where there are higher speeds and higher volumes, the idea is really to begin um, separating um, cyclists and, um, uh, so that they're not in mixed or shared traffic. So. Um, the you know treatment on top is called a side path. Sometimes that's also called a a, a shared use path, um, and there's guidance for that. And then ultimately uh, separated bike lanes, which are really becoming popular um, in many different parts of, of the country. Um, there is a growing body of um, a growing body of evidence again that really shows that many people who would like to bike. Um, whether it's for fun um, or for getting to school or, or work or, or some other trip purpose, but who don't feel safe riding in the roadway would feel safe if there was a um, you know, separate uh, dedicated um, pathway. And it doesn't have to be you know off in the woods or anything, but it could be right parallel next to the road with only a minimal curb or some other, some other kind of physical uh, separation. And this just shows a graphic that shows how a uh, you know dedicated um, bike lane can uh, be inserted um, along the edge of the road um, that is meant only for people on bikes um, that would be separate from the actual sidewalk. Um, and so, just to show this uh, table once once more, you can see that for each different treatment um, going across that way, this one focuses in on the actual uh, separated bike lanes and shows what the different street types would would be where it makes most sense. And this is a, uh, I'll call it a, uh, a, a really general guideline here. Um, so in addition to the overall street types, we also included in the plan other forms of guidance that aren't necessarily tied to the, to the different, different types of streets, but would be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis and a project-by-project -project basis. Things like um, um, intersection crossings, um, crosswalk treatments, um, those, uh, uh, there's also conflict areas where um, there are turn lanes and you have uh, bike lanes and you use green paint or down on the right there what we call bike boxes. So um, you know, bikes can um, wait and dwell at a red light um, and, and that cars know that, that that's a you know, space meant, meant for bikes. Um, we also include guidance on uh, the traffic calming as well as transit. Um, these are some images of the different uh, traffic calming measures, um, speed tables and humps, um, as well as uh, bump outs, uh, diverters, um, and then also thinking about transit and the proper placement for transit um, uh, stops. And I understand that you're going to be talking later in the evening about a potential um, FTA grant for transit-oriented uh, development, which um, I think might have great um, might have great promise here, and I think it's a that's a very interesting opportunity. Um, and then things such as um, streetscape uh, design, uh, things like lighting and furniture and bike racks, as well as green infrastructure, which I know that you all have been um, working on for years, and how that can fit um, into the uh, into the actual um, street uh, you know scape with uh, you know storm water. Um, 
um, um, areas that, that can also be extremely um, attractive amenities for the street. And this idea also of placemaking, which is how to use the you know, public right of way and public plazas and you know, streets to actually take back areas to sort of humanize and help calm traffic, but also to create more of a sense of place and to actually draw in more, more people to linger. Um, this is a, a, a very vital uh, concept um, in uh, you know, planning, and we're doing a lot more, more of this. So there is some guidance there in the, in the plan as well. And then um, towards the end of the plan, we also wanted to include several samples of how existing streets could be transformed or actually retrofitted um, with some of these treatments. And at the, at the top is just a sample cross section of an existing um, you know, street. Um, it's a, it's a four-lane section currently, and within the same right-of-way, uh, which showing the first option, um, it's possible to narrow those, those lanes and create a side path for peds and bikes, um, where currently there really isn't um, enough room because the lanes are so wide um, right now. So you can kind of re reclaim some of that without actually reducing the number of lanes. Alternative two goes a little further, and it, it's what we call a road diet, where we go from four lanes down to three lanes, but you pick up a center turn lane, which can actually make it safer. Um, and at the same time, you can add more room for bikes, for a um, side path, as well as for a, as well as for a paved shoulder. And the second example that we showed um, at the top shows an existing uh, two-way uh, downtown um, you know, section with, with very wide lanes, probably overly wide. And if you think of this as the, you know, the same width from, from um, end to end or you know, side to side, there's a lot that it can actually be done. And um, looking at the first option, um, Sorry, I'm going to Madam interrupt Mayor, you. Yeah. Uh, I just want to be conscious of the like, time. We're almost like, oh, fantastic. like okay. two minutes. Great. I should have said that after. You're doing great. Okay. So thank you. <laughs> yep. So the, uh, the first example shows how um, if, you, if there was a willingness on that particular section of street to remove on-street parking, um, you could add a separated two-way bikeway. Um, with the second alternative, you could retain one side of the street as on-street parking, but also add bike lanes. So, and there's other things that can be done also, but these, these are just um, a couple of examples. So before, last you, but not, before you go off that, yes, sir. I just do have a go good back. quick question yeah. there. How many of our streets in Montpelier have the width to do that? Yeah. Well, um, so in this particular example, yeah. so this is modeled off of existing State Street okay. in front of the Capitol. So there's the right of way there. And we actually measured the lane widths. They're really wide. Um, and wide lanes sort of encourage cars to go faster. It's just a visual cue. Mm -hmm. um, but if we did, if either of those things were done, you could see that there's still adequate and ample room for the lanes. And all of those um, widths there are actually tied back to the table that I showed earlier. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then, so in terms of implementation, um, working um, with um, um, Kevin and Mike and Corey here over the, over the last year. We, um, we established a, a proposed framework in terms of how, the, how projects could be implemented. And again, it's a little bit too um, small to read um, on, the, on the screen, but it could either be done in, in the top box, A, through the regular O&M or operations maintenance, such as you know, every year there's, new, uh, there's roads that are going to be re, repaved. And if they are, if, if they're minor projects like uh, installing bike lanes, it's really just paint. So when you would go to pave those um, sections, that could be done as part of the regular O and M um, schedule. For more significant projects, B would be projects that would be um, prioritized through the capital improvements um, program, and then under that, showing the the uh, numerous um, steps that would be needed to uh, get that from planning into implementation. Um, and then finally, last but not least, we also uh, recommend doing pilot and sort of uh, you know, pop-up um, projects to really test out ideas. 
Um, some of these things might be controversial, um, but there's always um, trade-offs and pros and cons, and <laughs> trying something out and seeing if it works well or for a period of six months or, or a year to see how it does, and, and that's, that's something that, that can also be tried. This is just a, a um, photo that uh, one of the people on my staff took of Montpelier downtown when a, when a parklet was uh, installed, I think, within the last year or so. And this is, this, this is, the, this is the kind of place-making pro, uh, project or um, um, effort that can really show um, how things can transform over time. And um, so, um, yeah, pilot, pilot projects can, can be a very useful, useful tool. Um, that's what I have, um, and I uh, wanted to save as much time for any questions that you all might, might have, anything that either of these gents <coughs> might want to add to what I've already said. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Rosie. So I was a little confused reading through the materials. I assume that this is sort of a summary of other, like, is there a plan for each actual street or did you just do typology and say this typology should do this thing? We were very deliberate um, working with um, staff to come up with street types um, and then show a couple of samples but not tie it to uh, specific locations. Okay. And I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that but that was the that was the approach that we wanted to take for the for the project. I I'm going to interrupt here because I kind of I had the same question. I mean, this is an incredible document. I I was very happy to be to to geek out in this. It was so fun, um, and I really want to uh, translate all of this work to some kind of a work plan. Do you know what I mean? Like how where how do we lay this out? It wasn't totally clear to me. Sort of like Bill's question. So what if we're designating certain typologies for streets? Uh, what aspects of these streets fit that and what needs to be changed. That wasn't totally clear to me. Um, and uh, what would need to be done. So coming from this proposal, what what are our next steps? And I think that's sort of where you were getting at at the end with like some of these things are easy, we can build them in. Others we're going to need to have a more robust process around that. Um, but the 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 part of me that really likes to go deep with this kind of thing, um, like I I almost want to be able to see what is that list look like and let's parse it out into this one's going to be easy, this one if we if we want to do it is going to take some time. Talk about um, downtown planning this next step. Yeah, so like well, um, just if you do look at the at the at the map, there was. Um, for example, it's a special study area. One of the pieces that we didn't include in this uh, um, in this project was State and Maine, um, and part of that was a was a, a, a need to do. Um, it really needs further study um, and a streetscape plan, um, and so you know you could apply as a general typology to it, but it wouldn't take into account the entire unique nature of the, those two areas. The idea was was that you know when we have these typologies, it goes out and it identifies what your kind of optimal situation is. So then, when it comes time for you know Corey to do a project on the street, they may look at that and say, okay, this is this typology. Then what will it need? Um, what are the existing conditions? The current existing conditions and make the list of what needs to be done at that time. One path, one, excuse me, that's one pathway forward. That also feels very passive to me, like, oh, we're happening to do this anyway. I, let's build it in. But if that's really what we want, then let's put it on the list and get it done. Uh, I'd, I'd rather be more active about it. This is me, you know, personally speaking, right? I, I, uh, but I think we also, um, I, does it seem reasonable to come up with that list of like here are the things that need to happen and to enact these things? Mike, can I answer that? Um, I think also Mike Miller might want to answer that too. But okay. go ahead, Donna, okay. and then Mike. I've been on the committee. This is we've been working a long time, year plus, and I, I see it as a tool, and so it's out there to use every time we went. And if the city council adopts a complete street one as its guideline, let alone this report, then the staff would integrate it, I think, with the CIP. And then we're looking at streets and what we're doing, and we move forward. 
in a consistent, very aggressive way. But so the answer is kind of both. We could yes, but yeah. we need to adopt. But it's not a it's not a passive intention at all. Okay. It's being to be very aggressive. Yeah. Okay, in an affordable that, way that you can sustain. Yeah, I would say that this plan is your kit of parts that you yes. use to um, begin Toolbox. implementing moving forward. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mike. Yeah, so I just wanted to go in through a uh, comment that one of the other things we wanted to do with this plan was to make sure we got on paper what our street types would be for every street because what we wanted to make sure is first of all we would, we would have an entire network. We didn't want to have a bike path that just comes to an end because there wasn't a plan for what was going to happen or no bike path is coming up one way and a bike path is coming down another way. We wanted to make sure we had a network so we could have a map that would say you could know if you lived on Town Hill, how would you get into town on a bike? How would you get in get into town by foot? You'd you'd actually have it on the map. It may not all be there, but we could start to go and look at we really need to have a sidewalk here to complete this. We could do that a uh, little bit more of that gap analysis. The other thing we wanted to be able to do with this product with the map is to make sure that we didn't have a battle on every street. Um, we really need to know how the network's going to look, and we can't go and have a, street, a, a battle which goes and says we're going to have on-street parking on this street, and then halfway down when it comes time to pave the next street, on-street parking loses and we have a bike path. So we have a bike path that goes to nowhere because it runs into on-street parking because we didn't have a plan in place that said this street, is this street going to have on-street parking or is this plan going to have, is this street going to have a bike path? Because it can't have both. We don't have the real estate to have both on a lot of our roads. So we kind of have to pick it. And, we, and so part of the plan is we put something on a map, we can argue and debate and change it at some point, but the idea now is We've set out what we think it should be, and now we can start to plan ahead to make that happen. Okay. And as opposed to street by street, segment by spe segment, paving project by paving project, have a battle between parking interests and bike interests. So is it the intention of this group to continue to meet to flesh this out? I think the plan is intended to kind of be wrapped up, and it, it's it's we, we hope it's going to be more of a static plan, but it's a plan and it can be adjusted and changed as, as conditions change and as situations change. Um, you know, we're having discussions about whether or not we build a parking garage in the downtown. That could impact how we treat some of our streets going forward. If we decide to build a parking garage, maybe that on-street parking is not as needed. If we decide not to have a parking garage, maybe we need to have more on-street parking. So it's not meant to be fixed, fixed, mm. but the idea is you would shift from one street typology. Each type is meant to be internally consistent. So it's, it's meant that if we adopt a type three street, it's going to be safe for a pedestrian, it's going to be safe for a biker, and it's going to be safe for a car. Um, you can't just mix and match parts because you can't put bikes next to on-street parking or you'll get doored. So. You, you have certain things that you can put together and certain pieces you can't, and we've thought about those when we put together types that work internally. And somebody could say, I don't like this as a class five or type five street. I think it should be a type six street. That's a policy decision. But we know type five streets are safe, and we know type six streets are safe. It really becomes a policy decision as to how we want to handle it. And that's, those are some of the discussions we want, to, what we want to have. We've created a bunch of safe streets and we can adjust the map going forward. But we've made a map, so now everybody can say, I like this, I like how my street is designated, or I don't like how my street is designated. Okay. So thank you. Ashley. The other thing I would just point out, because I know that it's going to come up, four of these typologies, five of these typologies include no parking at all. And right now, the only parking that we have uh, in a lot of parts of town is on street. So I just, I just, want to be mindful of that uh, as we sort of think about all of this moving forward. And I know that there are some big decisions for us to make about a number of different things. Um, and I, I think that's an integral part of the conversation because unfortunately, it's we're still in a place where we need to have that conversation. Other comments? Jack. Um, I, get, I get what you're saying that every street type like this is safe. One thing uh, that I'm curious about, because you know, I think we all hear people complaining about <laughs> the traffic in this little town and coming from a big city, 
you think it's a joke that people complain about traffic here, and logically so, but uh, is, there, uh, is there data on moving to, whether moving to a system like this has any effect on uh, speed of traffic flow? Well, I think that um, you can't make a, a blanket uh, statement about you know something like that. I think that there is a there is a, a healthy body of evidence that shows that there are um, you know demonstrable benefits for doing things like road diets, but also not just benefits, but that it also improves safety and that it can actually improve traffic flow. Um, in the case of uh, a you know four lane. You know, section that has no, um, you know, turning lanes is off. There are often higher crash um, sites because the people get rear-ended if there are, you know, lots of driveways or you know turns. Um, there is a lot of evidence to show that things like road diets actually reduce the number of lanes from four to three, where where it's warranted, where where it can work, and where the where the volumes are within sort of um, acceptable limits, that it can actually reduce the number of crashes and actually have. Um, the sort of benefits about int introducing bikers and walkers and, and, be, and be able to uh, improve access. So I think everything is always about trade-offs. You know, I think that if there's a if there's a certain project that might result um, in a little bit longer peak hour um, delay to get from point A to point B in the in the morning peak, that might increase your travel time as a driver for, from say three minutes to three and a half minutes. Is that a worthwhile trade-off to to get what you're gonna? Sort of benefit from so I think that's a, also sort of a you know, policy uh, decision on a, on a case by case basis. But there is a lot of evidence out there. Well, you see, what I was hoping you were going to say was, if you if you get rid of parking on one side of the street, that actually enables uh, traffic to go faster because you don't have people stopping for people who are parallel parking. But it it's sounds like you are saying there is a, there is a potential trade off of. Uh, and obviously, three to three and a half minutes or three to five minutes is not. It can be a complex issue because if you take away parallel, if you take away on street parking, and it helps um, speed up traffic, that may not be what your objective is. You might not want traffic to go faster. You you want it to flow. Um, you want it to flow um, steadily, but at a slower rate to make it more acceptable and more calm. You know, um, and even more so in a sort of um, downtown area. Um, so. You know, again, there's there's no easy answer there. It's it's really a, quite a complex issue, um, and and oftentimes there, there is it has been shown that by getting rid of on street parking, which has an economic value to those businesses, sometimes if you put a protected bike lane in its place, that will actually increase access for the number of people and shoppers there. Um, there have been um, studies showing that, but I'm not saying that you should always get rid of it or you should always keep it. It's really on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And I guess hypothetically, if you're making these streets safer for other modes, you're expecting people to use those other modes, and not as many vehicles are cluttering the streets and, and yep. make, making it easier to commute, yeah. less vehicles. Glenn. Um, thank you. It's really neat presentation um, and I don't want to draw anyone out too far but one of the most interesting parts for me was where you pointed out that uh, one of the alternative samples was based on State Street um, hypothetically hypothetically yeah. and and it was really interesting to me to imagine State Street in those two alternate mm -hmm. uh, modes uh, I wonder if anyone would be willing to uh, give an example of, of a really ripe spot in Montpelier uh, for uh, a, a change in this direction it, along along that kind of line. Like imagine State Street being narrower lanes, bike lanes on both sides. Any other spots? Well, I would imagine that in the follow-up um, study that that will probably be part of that uh, scope of work. Um, I wouldn't, I don't think that we would want to venture at this point because yeah. we haven't done that kind of analysis. So, yeah. yeah. Donna. Well, we actually do have the Main Street scoping that is looking at that for Main Street. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking and about. And if you put in roundabouts, you don't you get rid of the turn lanes so you have more space. If you do some angle or park parking, there's lots of ways on Main Street that you can make it look like that. And we, we have some concepts that are going to be coming from the Main Street scoping study. 
It feeds right into this. It's yeah, good. Get ready for it in um, August. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. So I'm really excited about this. Um, in my mind, we can't do it fast enough, right? Like I'm, uh, I'm excited to to get into it. Um, so uh, uh, d uh, my understanding was that we were just, you know, hearing this report. But Donnie, you mentioned something about um, accepting this. I don't know what? that. My interpretation is that we don't need a motion on any on any of this. But what's your thought? Well, I was going back from a statement from Tom that he said he really needed a statement ultimately from the city council adopting a resolution about complete streets as far as guiding DPW. And so I assume at some point the study would be accepted, whether it's now or not. I was surprised on the agenda that isn't brought up, but I thought we would want Currently the city doesn't have technically a complete streets policy. We follow state statute. We don't have a local. We don't. We don't policy. have our own policy. I mean, one hypothesis is that we could uh, make a motion tonight and say, you know, we accept this as the the toolkit, uh, and we want to follow these guidelines as much as we can. Another hypothesis is that we wait, and you could bring us a more outlined resolution um, that we could approve at a later time. I I also think that just given some of the areas where there is no designated parking I think it needs to be a much bigger conversation just just because of all of the feedback that we've received so I I, I would not be in favor of any sort of motion or resolution tonight because I think it needs more public input how do you feel about coming back with a resolution I mean yeah I, I mean I think <laughs> my, my general feeling on it was was that the presentation tonight would then kind of open up a period, which is why I didn't put a resolution on it now, is open up a period for public comment. Mm. Yes. Um, you know, and I think Mike alluded to this as well, is that, you know, this isn't a, you can adopt it, the Complete Streets Plan, that doesn't mean that, you know, individual streets are, to Ashley's concern about parking, that you, you, you know, you don't adopt a plan just because of a single street or whatever. I'm just saying because it's included in the presentation tonight, if the, if the request is that we adopt the presentation, I mean, that includes a list of s potential proposed streets, and I, I don't think, I think I would need to see the August report before adopting anything like that. Yep. Uh. I understood this not to be the Bible of every street, but the ideal of every street, and hence, even within the, the uh, MTIC, the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, we discuss parking, and we know we're going to need parking, but the ideal is to go to this complete street vision and then say, okay, in this street, where are we going to have to make a compromise? And try to not compromise too much, but to have an ideal. This is the ideal. So I just... So maybe bearing that in mind that there may be some exceptions, it's not necessarily blanket, particularly considering parking. Um, is that some, could you all come back with a resolution that we could vote on? Maybe MTIC should uh, sure. make a recommendation to the council of how they'd like to proceed with this That's resolution okay. and That's plan great. a sure. process for rolling it out. They're the ones that have worked with it and hearings and... All right. Does that sound all right to everybody? Sure. Okay. Because I know, know the MTIC would, would like a resolution from the council on traffic calming, too. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could do that together. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Is, Thank you. This is, is really very cool. I, I didn't know if we were going to discuss that now. I know we're, I know oh. we're hurting for time. Yeah, uh, yeah. I but snuck it in. I, <laughs> I was really glad to see yeah. the well, traffic coming. Well, I know that the committee is looking for some sort of um, guidance on whether a traffic coming program would be accepted by this council or not. Um, or like a straw okay. vote tonight or something? Um, I think there's a real need for a traffic calming process. Um, I think one of the, some of the questions that you outlined at the end um, of this, if I can scroll fast enough down there, um, those felt like the right questions. Um, so what I, what I picture is, um, we either need some kind of a policy or a process through which we can handle traffic calming um, suggestions or requests, right? So speed tables, 
uh, you know, additional crosswalks, et cetera. So um, I, I'm either looking at city staff or the MTIC group to come up with defining that process. And that's something that, you know, when people from a particular street say, hey, we'd really like it to get speed bumps or a speed table, that we can crank it through that process. And, mm -hmm. you know, they get input from other neighbors or, um, you know, it's vetted by these, you know, four different departments or whatever it is, uh, um, whatever that process looks like. I, I think that would be a useful thing for us so that we can equitably evaluate uh, traffic calming requests. And Does that answer your that, question? Yeah, that type of what you're speaking about um, takes a lot of time to put together. And I think their fear was, let's not go through that and then present it to the council and just not not anyone be interested in it. Because yeah. it's, and I, like I said in my memo, the, in the late 1990s, that's what happened. Um, I would assume that if you gave us some um, check-ins along the way, you know, don't come to us with the final draft. Um, maybe with like a first draft, are we on the right track? Um, that way we can avoid the, you know, you've worked for six months on it and Sorry, yeah. I, I think you're also asking is, is this something that you want staff to pursue traffic coming as a, in theory, right? Like not just the process, but some total, right? Two, two separate things. So before we get to that question, are other people in straw poll style here just in favor of having some kind of a process? I yes. think what you're outlining, the process by which if there's a request from the public, we right. go through evaluating that request would be really useful. Mm -hmm. And I would be in mm -hmm. favor of directing the committee to work on that. Okay. And then the second question, what you're asking. Just me. <laughs> I'm getting. A lot, I'm seeing a lot of yeah. head nods here, so that's good. Um, but the second thing that I'm hearing from you is, do we want to pursue traffic calming just in general? Um, and to that, I guess I would say I'm in favor of the complete streets plan. <laughs> um, beyond that, I'm not sure I'm in favor of traffic calming for the sake of traffic calming, except where it's identified that right. people need it. I don't know. Other thoughts? It, it's, it's a tool, complete streets. Yeah. And uh, I, I'll say personally that as a chronic pedestrian, I'm almost always in favor of traffic calming. And as a resident on Prospect Street, I am specifically in favor of traffic calming on Prospect Street. So if that <laughs> helps, <laughs> small data point. Yes. East State, too. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm not sure I really answered your question. I think the, I think the committee has its... Uh, guidance. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The other just point about um, check-ins periodically, anything you want to put in the weekly memo about kind of the direction you're headed would be useful and then we can flag it and say, oh no, you know, don't do, don't do that or this seems problematic um, bef without having to come do a formal presentation. Okay. Okay. Thank you very, Thank very you. much. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. When are you opening the Montpelier your office of Alta? Oh, boy, that would be a <laughs> dream come true. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, my daughter goes to Goucher. Oh, really? So I'm down your way. I live a half a mile from there. Yeah. Okay, so just a reality check, team. Thank I'm you, anticipating Kevin. an end time of 1030. <laughs> <laughs> just... That seems overly optimistic. <laughs> Do you think? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I'm hopeful. I, I I'm hopeful. I'm assuming 11. Uh, oh, really? OK. We'll I see. figured 11.30. OK. Oh, I'm going to aim fatalist. for 10.30, though. Uh, so <laughs> moving right along, uh, I think we are up to the pocket park discussion. Yes. Um, Ward, you're Which welcome to the, um, come up and stabilization since they're here. Well, Ward's here, too. Uh, yeah. Let's. Well, I guess well, I'm in favor of doing it in order that, that's, that's right. on that's on here. Um, Ward, do you want to come up and introduce yourself? You don't really need to say anything necessarily, but I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't. No, I don't. Um, I'm Ward Joyce, and uh, I've developed four different public space projects in Montpelier, starting with the Pocket Park. Or excuse me, the Parklet, which was the last slide in the Complete Streets. The Parklet moved over and became the Pocket Park. Then I did Langdon Street Alive, and then Ann and I just did the Gearton Pocket Park. Um, the Pocket Park that we're talking about here seems to me like a conflict between a landowner and a leasee. And I don't know who the leasee is. It's kind of Montpelier. It's kind of ETC. It's kind of me. And we appear to have an intractable situation where the Jacobs family's asking more than anybody seems to want to um, provide. So $30,000 is a lot all of a sudden. 
Um, but I wanted to thank the council, most of you are new, for four years of support on this kind of project. I think one of our biggest victories was the Pocket Park program, which grew out of the pilot. So now that we have Pocket Parks formalized, that's a positive outcome Parklets. of this. Did you say something? You mean the parklets? Parklets. Did yes, I say you pocket, said pocket park? parks? Okay, no. The <laughs> park, yeah, I stumbled between those two. The parklet program is a victory or is an outcome of this tactical work. So the pocket park across the street wasn't meant to last 10 years, it was meant to last two or three or four. So if indeed it's going to be evicted in 30 days because the city doesn't want to come up with more than $5,000, which I understand, so be it. Um, it's going to go away. It cost uh, about fifty thousand dollars to put there, or forty. Maybe it's worth about forty thousand, and so it seems um, heartbreaking in a sense that uh, that uh, that it's going to go away because it had the potential to be a changer um, for the city in terms of urban quality and vitality. Um, but I think it's a kind of an intractable conversation and. and the bottom line is that if I don't champion that park, it goes away. And maybe that's, a, uh, maybe that's a reflection of the fact that it hasn't landed on fertile ground. I don't know. I've been told by more than 50 people that it was one of the nicest public spaces in downtown. And yet, you know, it's a short-term installation. And so um, I just want to thank you all for, I want to thank the city. I want to thank Tom McCardle and everybody that's helped make these things happen. And I, the reason I brought up, brought up the Park Lit program is because it's just important for all of us to remember that these efforts do want to lead to change. And so the Park Lit program was a great outcome. And let's hope that when park, pocket parks and parklets and all these things come up, that we continue to support them because they do make our city a better place to live. So, I think we can talk in some general terms about this. Um, but I just want to say one thing. Yes. Jesse Jacobs did tell me today that he is interested in compromising. But he will not be specific, which is a little challenging. So his current line is 30, and I don't know whether he'd come down to 20. But he did offer an opportunity for a lower price, but not specific. I mean, I, I, I'm going to speak for myself. Um, I'm not interested in offering any more than we have already offered on a yearly basis. Um, I am potentially interested in uh, purchasing the land if we could do so for uh, what is an, an appraised value and I would not want to offer any more than uh, an appraised uh, amount. Um, does anyone have different thoughts? An additional thought. An additional thought, yes. Uh, is there any other place that we could move the park to? We're working on that, actually. We may have some options. Yes, we may have an option, yeah. So I, I, along those same lines, um, when this came uh, before the council in... Uh, it, it has come before, the decision has come before the council before in executive session of whether this is a worthwhile thing to be negotiating on. So um, we have... This council and the prior council have discussed this. Um, Thank you. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I feel like this is a, a good use of a vacant lot, but if the landlord is saying that it's valued higher and he can get more for this uh, lot, then we, the city, would benefit from some higher use there. So if he can uh, rent it or sell it to someone who would build housing or... Um, you know, create some other public benefit, then I wouldn't want us to stand in the way of that by um, offering a, a higher uh, rental price for it than it's worth. Um, and I do think that, you know, we've done our due diligence and we are offering um, more even than the assessed value. Um, I also want to point out that we have this uh, city hall park right across the street that is very close to the, the pocket park and with the amount of money that we would potentially put towards a, a lease agreement, um, we could do some really great things with that space um, mm -hmm. and that could use some refreshing. So yep. we own a piece of land that's, that is very close by and, and we, we could right. do some cool stuff. Right. So I'd say the best outcome is for us all to learn that public space improvements are of value. And so it's tactically a strategy to show us the value of doing that. So I'm 
I accept that as a uh, potential outcome. Kind of surprised by the 40, 50K to set it up to begin with there. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you were to take it down and move it somewhere else, are you talking a similar amount or? No, we could move it, we could move it less expensively. Um, and I think we would have support to do it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. No, it's just, that's the value of what got built there. I mean, you, the original materials and the Yeah, labor. the materials, the labor, the design, the, and, you know, the land use, the donation of the land, the water. Uh, you know, we had backhoes on the site. I mean, you know, it took some money to build it. Uh, Jack, do you have a comment? I just completely agree with you that uh, we see, I think we all see the value of open public space in, in downtown. I was thinking when we were listening to the high school students earlier that one of my many brothers and a friend of his uh, lived in, in the opposite ends of the town that, uh, that we grew up in. And so my brother and his friend Goober just picked out a, a corner roughly in the middle of the two spaces and say they just hang out on this guy's front yard <laughs> yard and they'd go and we'll meet you over at Rock and Ackerman and they'd be there just hanging out and <laughs> pe people need spaces like that to hang out and I think we are going to continue to value that kind of thing. I also agree with everything Rosie said. Thank you. Okay. I assume that's all that probably needs to be said at this point. Um, Other than we yes, look Don. forward to working with you in the future. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, hope that if, not dead yet. if oh. uh, you know, the offer that we've made is not acceptable or, um, you know, if, if we're, if there's no possibility of purchasing the land uh, for the, you know, appraised value, um, that we'll find another location for it, um, that it's not wholly going away. It's just changing form a little bit. So. Yeah, and I think it was a generous okay. offer. Okay. So thank you for Thank you very much. And, and holding it there, and so see you again soon. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, uh, so now the tax stabilization uh, proposal. All right. And, and we definitely, we're not doing community justice center, Correct. right? We're definitely not doing the community justice center. Is this the microphone? Yes. After this, yes. I, and we're, I don't think we're doing strategic planning either. No, right. Okay. Um, so we have two more. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Shannon McIntyre. I am one of six owners at Timber Homes Vermont. Um, and we are planning to build a shop on Elm Street this uh, summer and fall in between Pearl Street Motors and Vermont Tree Experts, and I'm here to seek uh, tax stabilization, <coughs> level two. So you have their request, you have the letter, the information that I prepared with great help from Jamie, and um, we just did this recently, so yep. feel free to ask whatever questions you want. You do have to hold two hearings, so open the hearing. Okay, so um, at this point we'll open the the public hearing for this tax stabilization. Um, so members of the public can come and comment, but also counselors. Ashley, did you have a question? Yes. How many people are currently employed at your business? Uh, we have 11 long-term people and four um, summer short-term hires. And so I'm assuming then in 8 a, uh, it's expected that the Montpelier shop will ultimately employ between seven and nine people. That means just staff retention as is. There, so that's not seven to nine additional positions. That's just the existing positions. Um, it's not additional positions, but it's a move from our, currently our only shop is in Versher, which is about an hour south of here. And it's kind of like mm -hmm. one of those places you can't get there from here. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who um, have been working in that shop are hoping to move to Montpelier. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a migration within our company. Oh, Jack. I, the biggest question I have is probably not a surprise to you, which is it sounds like you're probably going to do this whether you uh, get the tax stabilization <coughs> agreement or not. Is that a fair statement? That is a fair statement. Yeah, it's a big enough project that tax stabilization is not a make it or break it thing for the project. Um, it would be a really meaningful and welcome gesture as we go through this period of growth. Um, 
and as our tax bill in Montpelier goes from it's currently a thousand dollars up to I believe it's between 13 and 15 is what's been estimated so it would be um, it would be a help for us as we grow our overhead but we are planning to move forward whether we get st stabilization or not Thanks. Ashley. are there any other types of infrastructure upgrades so I think I've been pretty clear in my position about tax stabilization as not the best way to create economic growth in Montpelier. Are there infrastructure things that the city could do to assist your business or frankly other businesses that are interested in moving to Montpelier? Because I think that's what cities do. Cities build infrastructure and cities house people and cities create space for people to be. Um, and so I'm curious if, if there are other tangible things that you could identify like infrastructure upgrades or space areas or sidewalks or, or things like that, that that you could identify that, that the city could do, since that's sort of where I, I stand in terms of creating economic growth in Montpelier. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that pops into mind, probably because we just watched this presentation, is better bike lanes out <laughs> to our property on Elm Street. But um, it's pretty far outside the city, so I can't think of anything else really that mm -hmm. would affect us very much. Okay, uh, Rosie. Um, will there, is there any possibility of any sort of um, public benefit to the space? I think you, you back up on the river there, yes. Mm -hmm. um, there's some, I, I, I know you're planning to build a building, but there's some uh, open land around there. Is there anything you're thinking along those lines or would be willing to consider along those lines? Um, yes, certainly. I mean, uh, we have been planning on building this shop for years, and so there's been lots of talk about how to use, um, more than half of our land is in the river corridor, so it can't be built on anyway. Um, and it's a beautiful parcel of land um, behind a knoll, so it's sort of shielded from Elm Street. And there has been talk of the, um, at least the floodplain portion of our land going into conservation um, or being accessible by the public in some way. Um, that's the major thing. So for when you come back the second time, um, if you um, have further thoughts on that or anything more concrete that comes out of that, um, that would be really helpful to me in, in understanding whether to, to support it or not. Um, and I, in general, in the past when we've considered these, when there has been a public benefit like that, that's much, much higher incentive to, to support the project, so. Great. Cool. Glenn. Um, just to further parse that uh, point that Ashley brought up earlier about uh, employment and employment changes, uh, the text in 8A is uh, the project The project can demonstrate to the satisfaction of the council that the project will positively affect in a significant way the number of employment opportunities in Montpelier. So I can... I, I can read that, I believe, uh, as um, there are no new jobs being created total. You're not adding people, but you are moving people that you already employ from, from a different place into Montpelier. And whether that is an employment opportunity that is added to Montpelier and whether it's significant seem like questions for us on the council. I don't know if that's a question to you or a point to bring up to the rest of the council, if anyone has any uh, thoughts just, on that point. Just as a point of information, yes. not opinion, um, the, was the only person around when the, this policy was for it was intended. Bill. It was intended to be new jobs coming into Montpelier. So as a you know, now, so that was a bright line. Even if they were just coming from Middlesex or a neighboring town, okay. they would be actually be in the city limits. No, I think the diff. The, the question of, and I think we tried to put that in our analysis of, is that significant? That's really your, it's just those are the words and okay. you can make your own finding. And just to get a little more detailed also, um, we're intending on hiring three, or hiring three of our summer help people on to help us build the shop. Um, and our, we don't want to get much bigger than 12, maybe at the outside 15 long-term people, but I see um, a, a sort of summer crew in our future. 
pretty consistently. So um, I, I don't want to come out and say, you know, we'll have 15 people employed in Montpelier, but we'll waffle between, you know, 12 to 15 full-time people and then a small summer crew as well. Okay, so uh, at this point, um, we don't necessarily need to make a decision. Um, any other comments from the public? Um, all right, so I'm going to close the public hearing. If there's anything specific you'd like them to come back with for the second hearing, you mentioned the public amenities, that would be. If there's anything else, any um, information, now's the time to and communicate that. Feel free to check in with city staff and connect with them on, on that sort of thing. <laughs> I'd actually like to see how much you're going to be paying these seasonal workers that you plan on bringing on board there. If you had how like an hourly you? rate or if it was a contract. Uh, you know, it'd be something I'd be interested in. Oh, I could tell you. Do you want oh, to know? that'd be yeah. great. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're the ones that we have on hire this summer and through the fall are making $18 an hour. Great. Thanks. Yep. Super. Um, no further questions. All right. So... Uh, I, we'll we'll take up the second hearing for this at our I think it's our next council meeting. Two weeks. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, and I think this is our last item for tonight. Did we decide we were or we're not going to do the home? Didn't Rosie pull something? Uh, that oh, that's right. We got to do that. It's going to be quick, quick, quick. Yeah, it'll be <laughs> fast. I'm sure. Did you want to do the? Um, well, we should do the. Do the what? Waste. Well, the, yeah, the home guess, buyer thing. But, Kevin's thing. Uh, I wasn't clear where we ended up. I, I would, I, I think um, I want to go with the, the wastewater, um, um, water resource recovery Worf. facility presentation for, um, first, because uh, I think we have some, that's a big decision uh, for us that I think is going to be, a, um, require some conversation. Um, so if it's not 10.30, <laughs> By the time we're done with that conversation, then maybe we could take that up. But I don't, yeah. I don't it's anticipate. It's the only thing that can It's not for. critically urgent that we make this decision about the home buyers program tonight. Is that right? Except for that people are maybe waiting. <laughs> right. <laughs> there is that. Uh, Jack? But our next meeting is still before the fiscal year starts. So... So we could do it on June 27. I don't know what the agenda is already looking like for June 27. It's not, yeah, it's not as well. <laughs> um, so, because it wouldn't take effect until Jul the next fiscal year anyway. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. Let's do, let's plan on that. I wasn't be happy. So okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Take it away. Okay. So I'm Kurt Monica, Public Works. Um, so I sent a memo out on June 1st that sort of outlined why we wanted to have this discussion here tonight. Um, basically, in order to progress the various aspects of the project to be ready for a bond vote in November, um, what we need from Council tonight is uh, which alternative that we presented on uh, on May 9th was, is the most preferred by Council. So we presented um, a base case of just doing the aging infrastructure at the plant, um, the the sort of middle case of doing some digester upgrades but not maximizing methane production, and then the the largest um, or the the biggest scope project, which is um, really setting up for a second phase uh, to utilize the methane for a beneficial use. Um, <clears throat> so, in the memo on the, that I sent out on June first. We are recommending to go with uh, the large um, two-phase project. What Right now, we'd only be developing phase one. Uh, phase two would uh, really come after uh, we, we're up and running. So we have a, an opportunity to sort of measure the methane. We have an opportunity to really get comfortable with, the, with all the new equipment that we're going to have at the plant before taking on you know, an, an additional um, burden on our staff for running additional equipment and really just give us a, a little more time to vet out all the options you know we've been talking a lot about CHP there are a lot of other options for the methane um, you know one thing that was brought up was a dryer that we did look at a uh, solids biosolids dryer that we looked at early on in the project but um, you know I think it's worth taking a step back and looking at that a little closer 
Um, you know, I really wanted to find a way to get it to district heat. That's probably not going to be economical, but uh, if the grant comes along between the next year or so, it, it may be economical. So I just want to keep all our options on the table, move forward with, uh, with the project, um, the phase one, get our equipment up and running and replace that needs to be upgraded. Um, but we didn't want to proceed with, with getting contractor pricing <laughs> and um, <coughs> setting up all our measurement protocol for verifying the savings that is in the contract with, um, with ESG, our consultant and really um, finalizing the contract itself with them. All that is gonna take time and we really need the next few months uh, concurrent with our pilot test of the septage at the plant um, in order to get everything ready for November. So that's really the gist of it. I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has um, about the, the various options that we're looking at or the two phases. Actually, Rosie. Most of my questions are probably more for Todd. Financial? Yes. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I'm glad that you sent that memo out the other day about debt servicing and, and sort of our bonding ability. So can you explain to everyone that's listening, who will listen, who is watching, to all of us, sort of what the impact would be. So so if we approve the, the recommendation from DPW, um, what would that mean come time to bond in like plain speak? <laughs> <laughs> so what would it mean in terms of when it comes time to bond? Like, is there a complication because of it? Well, or? so we, we have, we have limits that we have set mm -hmm. for ourselves as yeah. a city. And I think I, I want to make sure, I want, I want everyone else to understand what right. we sort of know about right. that. Okay. So prior city council adopted debt service policies that limit or are intended to limit the debt service in the general fund to 8.2% and to, for the municipality as a whole to 15% of total revenues. Um, the memo that I sent out to you indicates uh, what it would look like by adding this larger debt, whether it be 12.6 or $16 million into the total municipal graphing. Um, we'd still be well within policy limits um, taking on either one of these options. Uh, the financing structure is not finalized at this point because we don't have a definitive scope. So. Um, I had indicated that I was presuming a five-year interest-only payment with 20-year principal and interest following. Uh, we could extend that out to lower our debt service, ultimately at a longer, at a larger cost. Um, but there's different options, and I don't really know exactly what rates are going to do. We're in a strange environment right now, so that's another variable. Um, but the cost of construction continues to go up as well, uh, as we see almost daily. <laughs> um, so, you know, those are just... Uh, risks associated with this. Now, as far as the policy goes, the city council adopted it to be a policy limit for itself. It can certainly change or amend that policy. Um, if it were to, it, as far as the bond bank or the outside sector is concerned, as far as us exceeding that policy, um, that is a best practice, but our legal mm -hmm. authority to borrow is significant according to state statute at least. Mm -hmm. um, and it runs, I, don't hold me to this, but about 100 times our grant list, which is in excess of $8 billion. We're at like 30 million right now. So <laughs> it's, it's so far beyond the scope of anything that we would ever- You just took our breath uh, took away. <laughs> but you know, the, the purpose of the policy was to um, have a responsible outlook um, for both yeah. you know, the current users and the current residents and future residents and not um, strap you know, future generations with a whole bunch of debt for a current project. Um, this does have the benefit of lasting 25 plus years, regardless of which option you choose. Um, so I think the, the debt will amortize appropriately with the project uh, itself. And it has the potential for, you know, significant upside down the road as well. Um, I did not factor in the revenue gains mm -hmm. that we are predicting for this project in that graphing. So I took total revenue that we know as of today increased that by half a percent each year going forward, but we're actually going to have a greater revenue source, assuming everything comes together. And or a lower net payment if you look at it that and way. And a lower net, net payment. So 
there's you know variables right now where this you know just in common speak where this would impact us is if we didn't change the policy took on a 16 million dollar debt here and then wanted to build a 15 million dollar recreation center um, then we're going to be really starting to look at you know are we amending our policy or are we doing something different with the financing i personally and bill chime in look at the tiff district financing slightly yes. differently um, if that were to go if we were to do something with the tiff district um, since the bulk of that repayment will come from education funds that we wouldn't have had access to anyway um, that doesn't seem like it would necessarily uh, be appropriate to count within the existing policy so and that's a council decision that do you want to separate uh, TIF related debt um, or just separate the portion that is not covered by the increment and include that in your policy decisions and, and if that's Let's wait our con yours right. our conversations. Yeah. So. Those are options at least. I just I think pragmatically speaking, council should be aware of that though, and, and my understanding of the TIF proposal was, you know, so so we go ahead and we bond, regardless we have to pay it. I mean, so it so it it's sort of whether it whether that the ed fund actually ends up covering it or not, the city's still on the hook for those payments it's just yes. and then that and then that would in practice get added to our debt servicing Correct. totals it would but we then have to also increase our revenue so mm -hmm. the revenue for TIF is actually coming from education taxes mm -hmm. um, so that you know if I'm if I'm using a baseline 15 million dollar total revenue we really need to up that for mm -hmm. uh, the school portion that we would be gaining so it would change the graph and I'm happy to go through that exercise. And I think probably, you know, we've, we've been talking through different mm -hmm. options and not to get too into the minutia here, but one, probably the logical solution is if there is some, especially in the front years, if, if it's not fully covered, then that difference that's not covered with the end fund and the, the other revenues coming in, that, that would, we would count that against our debt policy because that's coming from the general debt, but for, to the extent that it's covered through it. Because we have to create a TIF fund to do this, so mm -hmm. I mean that's we have to track it. The monies go into it, the payments come out of it. So if anything's not covered by that, then so but it's it's a three quarter baked thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> not a fully baked thought yet. Yeah, it's very hard to hear the conversation. Oh, um, well, I will try and speak up. <laughs> Um, so moving away from the financing side of things, um, so I understand that you want direction from us tonight and then there's a go or no go at the end of August or sometime in August after the experimental trial phase has happened, um, which they're, they're going through right now. Um, and I really appreciate that you're experimenting and trying it out on the ground um, and I think that'll give us a better decision. There's a couple other things that I want to throw into that mix um, in terms of what we look at before the no or go, the go or no go <laughs> um, point. Um, one piece is I understand um, that the uh, engineering team hasn't, uh, the operator have not been able to go view um, one of these existing um, projects that have, have gone through this already. Um, and I understand that there is one in Niskayuna, New York, so it's not particularly far away, and I would like to um, have uh, the team go see that. Um, I don't think it would be a particularly costly investment given we're talking about <laughs> many millions of dollars, um, and I think that they could probably get a lot out of going and talking to the other plant operators and seeing something on the ground. Um, so I would like that visit to happen before that decision point. Um, the other, uh, another piece um, that I would like to have a better handle on is this court case. Um, I am concerned. We think we've got a good case, um, and we think that we're not going to have our, our limits adjusted. Um, but I'm concerned that if the outcome doesn't go the way we want it, um, that we would have made this extra um, infrastructure upgrade, assuming that we would be able to process more incoming product. Um, and if those limits are lowered, then we wouldn't be able to do that. The math starts to not work, and we would have made this huge extra investment that if we're able to bring the inputs actually nets us a, a positive um, 
budget impact, but if we're not able to bring the inputs, if we lose that court case, um, then we're on the hook for so much more. And so I know we can't, you know, we can't cover every possible scenario, but I'd like us to have a better handle on, um, you know, when we think we're going to get a resolution of that or, you know, what is our, what do we do in that, in that circumstance um, before making this decision. Um, and then uh, the final piece that I want to make sure is addressed is uh, the potential need for a generator upgrade. Um, and currently we, we have a backup generator because we can't afford to <laughs> have those plant operations shut down in the event of a power outage. And that backup generator is sized for the current needs of the plant. Um, it sounds like we think that there would be enough energy efficiency in the upgrades that it wouldn't need to be upgraded. But I want to verify that and make sure that that's included in the math that ESG is on the hook for in terms of making us whole. Um, and I don't want that extra cost of upgrading the generator, should we need to, to fall on us instead of on ESG. So um, those are kind of the, the three main things that I want to make sure that we get resolved in addition to um, going through this trial period before we have the, the go or no go. Um, if all those are resolved correctly or in, in, a, in, a, in a positive way, um, then I would be, you know, happy to support it. And at this point, with those caveats, I'm willing to support the, the phase one um, as you have suggested. Um, I just touched on the, on the permit question. Sure. I don't know if this is the one that works. And so on the, on the permit issue, um, so in the, in the agreement with ESG, they're not, um, the project can't increase the effluent limits that we put out. So whether or not we did this project and our limits got dropped, um, for some reason through the court appeal, we'd have to do likely a, a significant upgrade of a different style potentially. Um, but we can't, the, the issue is we can't, our aging infrastructure needs to be replaced before the court case is resolved. So we can't wait and see what happens um, to that court case before we make a decision as far as moving forward with one of these three options. It, it, My concern is that the aging infrastructure input costs, the amount we're spending is, would be significantly lower um, than the phase one input cost. It's just that we think we're going to make up phase one in so much extra income. Yeah. And the, if we can't, then the debt we would service have been better. Or our, our bond payments would be the right, same the, or more. The, but the point, I think, what she's saying is that if, if our effluent limits were dropped, mm -hmm. then we might not be able to take in that extra income, which makes the net bond payments. In other words, it might be if if we thought we if we thought if we're going to lose the court case, mm -hmm. would it be smarter to just do the basic eight, eight instead of spending this money and then not getting the offsetting revenue? Right. If if for some reason we then couldn't meet the new effluent limits, or is that a completely different process that we'd have to do no matter what? That's what I think. Right. It, it would be a completely different upgrade for e under either aging infrastructure. To 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 lower to if if our for some reason our effluent limit was significantly lowered by, by permit, um, we would have to do a, a completely different style upgrade to the plant, whether or not we took in the, the, um, added the high strength waste or not. So it wouldn't get us away from doing that upgrade if our permit limits were lower, we'd still have to do it. Would the upgrade, I'm assuming that the upgrade would have to be more expensive and bigger if we were processing more incoming product. Um, I, I think it would be pretty, pretty similar because, um, because of the way we structured the agreement with ESG and that they can't change our current limits. So that's just, I mean, you don't have to resolve it tonight, but that's, yeah. that's one thing I need to know before August. Right. So. No, I understand. Okay. Hmm. Ashley. I guess sort of hearing it rephrased that way, it, I mean, lawyer, <laughs> lawyers and the court process take forever. <laughs> um, Realistically, we probably won't have a decision for an extended period of time on this issue. Is that fair to say? I, I really can't say for sure. But it'll, it'll, the last one took, I think, 10 years to resolve last time our permit was appealed. <laughs> wow. Well, boy, that makes me <laughs> complain a lot less about my job. Um, so I didn't really, I'm a little, the 10 years is kind of surprising. Um, I figured you would say like two years. Um, so it sounds like at least one part of the project is substantially the same. It like 
that that the aging infrastructure pieces have has to happen. That's right. Right. And so is it and I and I'm only asking and I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but is it something where it could be a conditional like if the state approves, you know, and if 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 the court decides in favor of Montpelier, then we would proceed with the other piece if the court decides against raising the limits. Um, I think it would be difficult to get a contractor to price out a project like that. Um, and Larry's here for me, so you can speak to that. But I and I, I think I, I think I, I sort of like it, if I were the lawyer in the room, I know what I would say. But I think it's a fair question to ask, especially given the ten year. I mean, if we're going to be litigating this for that long, and well, we don't know though. Don't I mean, know. this is the second run at the same issue, and so it. You know, the courts have all seen it, and there's a Supreme Court decision now that there wasn't before, and mm -hmm. so who knows? Right. I, it just seems like it might be a prudent approach so if there were willing parties at the table. It could. Sure. Hi, Larry Doyle with ESG. Uh, I, I think part of the answer would be, you know, Kurt, Kurt mentioned that there would be an upgrade cost either way, so if, if the phase one project weren't done, the facility would still be subject to some type of an upgrade as it would under the phase one project. So I think one of the things we could probably get back as an answer is what's that delta? Right. You know, is it a hundred dollar change under the basic project and hundred and fifty dollar change under ours? And I'm not sure. I know we've looked at that, but I think we'll revisit that and see if we can come up with a, an engineer's mm -hmm. probable estimate of cost. The upgrade will have some benefits to the plant in terms of, of its flexibility and, and ability to handle and treat certain nutrients. So there are some upside advantages to making the digesters work and digest. So it's kind of a balance, you know, there's a number of factors in, but I think we'll crunch through some of those numbers and Kurt provide you to get an answer back. Other comments, questions? Uh, okay, so um, I guess I'll just weigh in in that you know I'm happy to support your suggestion. Um, part of me is a little sad that we're not going for phase two right away because that's you know go big or go home, right? Like let's do let's do it up. But if phase two is something that maybe we can consider um, further down the road, fine. Let's get some success. There's lots to think about. It's still a lot of money. Um, Fair enough. Uh, so we need some kind of vote on this? Probably, right? Because it's uh, going to inform our design decisions. I yeah, think. Jack. I'm, I'll am i make a motion that, uh, that we approve the uh, plan of the Department of Public Works to proceed on the basis of uh, doing phase one, recognizing that this isn't the final decision on what's happening. Second that. Any further discussion? Uh, yes, Glenn. Just to be clear, are we talking? I can't hear you, Glenn. Okay, sorry. To be clear, are we talking phase one energy neutral? Is yes. that the? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you for all the good material. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Can you too, Todd? I know, right? It's only 10.07. I like your charts. I <laughs> oh, my gosh. I like charts. Is anybody still still here for these other things? Probably not. Uh, one possibility, team, is that we could continue to not talk about the strategic plan. <laughs> or we could, because it's not 10.30. But <laughs> I'm fine so, letting so it go. Let Plus, we have to talk about MIAC. We do oh, have that's to talk right. about MIAC. Yeah. So with regard to the strategic plan, I, I don't want to open up the whole can of work, but really all we were, was, my goal tonight was just to sort of proof check what you did. So if, if people have had a couple weeks since, they, since we did this and you've read the plan and if anybody really wanted to make a case that something should be drastically different, we wanted to have that opportunity because we're putting work plans to each, you know, specific efforts that you'll see at the next meeting, and we just didn't, you know, we want to make sure it was still matching. So if people are happy, that's the end of this agenda item. I had a few things. <laughs> 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 see, I gave you too much warning. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so I'm, I can run through this really quickly. Nope. Okay. Just kidding. <laughs> Let's. <laughs> Rosie says no. I, I just, we got to end these at 10 o'clock. Yep. Like it's just no, I'm late. with you. I'm with you. Um, we'll take it up next time. And make it the first agenda item next time. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we, well. We're going to set a date for the hearing. The, uh, oh, right. Well, let's Denver do the MEAC Street. thing first, and then let's set a date for the... Uh, so, um, MEAC had proposed a number of changes to their bylaws. As I was reading through the bylaws, I noticed this one sentence that says, nominating new members, current board members will nominate and propose all new board members to city council, um, which is not how we normally do things with most committees. Um, it sounds like that was a carryover from when the organization was an independent organization. Um, I did have a chance to check with the chair of the committee and she said that actually this hasn't been their practice, um, that they have relied on us to advertise for vacancies. Um, so she didn't have a problem with us just striking this. So um, I would move uh, that we uh, adopt the uh, bylaw amendments uh, as proposed by MEAC with the addition of striking the sentence, nominating new members, current board members will nominate and propose all all new board members to city council. I'll second that. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. That was a good catch. Um, deliberative session. Deliberative session. So one hypothesis is that we tack it on to another meeting Another hypothesis is that it's its own separate time. I don't have strong feelings about this. <laughs> what is... To do it at a separate time? Separate time? Do you want to pick like a Wednesday that we're otherwise not meeting? Well, we've, we're also running into vacations too. And I'm That's just inevitable. About, uh, after the 27th, I've got two weeks when we're not, when I'm not going to be here. And that's why we, it's one of the reasons we took off the 11th of July, right. if we have a light, it's not as light as it used to be, but if we have a lighter uh, agenda for the 27th, it might not be a bad thing to do it on I the 27th. I don't think we do. I mean, it's lighter than tonight, maybe, but we also just pushed a couple things what, from tonight, and we're starting Wednesday? with a fire department I tour. Can't do next too short. Wednesday, 20? Too short. What? What's too short? Notice for next Wednesday for me. Oh, I, you mean the I, 20th? I'm like booking like two or three weeks well, out. What about the 20? So oh gosh, the 27th is meeting. regular council meeting. We've well, got next Wednesday is July 4th fire tour. Yeah, definitely not July 4th. Um, I'm available. I don't have to work. <laughs> I mean, the next time would be July 11th. Can if we do we're a working. doodle poll? Yeah, to why don't we do that? You know, I think the other thing. I mean, I'm just going to say this out loud, but you know, it may not take that long. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. You know. We could probably have an executive session tonight. I mean, I don't know. So, <laughs> could we have it let's maybe? do a doodle poll. Let's do a doodle poll. And it, maybe it'll be a call. We could always do a call in. We could do a I'm, conference uh, I'd call be down for thing. Okay. Everyone's got the evidence, right? So, when we do the doodle poll, um, maybe we could just keep in mind that you don't have to be physically present. <laughs> like, or right. would you be available for a call in even? It sounds like that's not Ashley's favorite thing, but that's okay. <laughs> Just like in person. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, the, it's not my yeah, favorite conference thing calls either. are terrible. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. It's terrible. And we'll uh, find we'll find something. We have that a works. new conference phone, though. Oh, okay. I mean, uh, yes. I, I, I'd like to just argue for uh, speed in general. Uh, I think the the sooner we can get it done within the sixty day limit would Me be too. my preference. Yep, I agree. Okay, so doodle poll. We'll okay. get that done soon. All right, wow, and it's only 10 12. <laughs> oh, uh, council reports. I don't remember where we started. So we're going to start with Ashley. We'll go that way. Oh, hot seat. Um, I'm going to pass. Okay. I have two things. One, I've been given the uh, discussion we've had in the last uh, few weeks of the uh, parklet ordinance and some dis dissatisfaction people have with it, I, I went through one period where two days in a row, the first thing that I uh, was thinking about when I woke up was writing out 
proposed changes to the to the parklet ordinance. So I thought, and I didn't do it the first of those days. So I thought, well, I should actually do that. And so I've been uh, <clears throat> talking, figuring out what I think would make sense to make it a more uh, more standards-based and uh, rational approach. And I uh, sat down and talked to Rosie about it a little bit, talked to Bill a little bit, and I think that I'd like to, uh, I'm gonna continue to pursue having, pl planning how we could restructure that. That's the one thing. The other thing is, uh, something that I'm really struck by tonight, and Stephen brought this up, but every time I've been at a meeting when there's any significant number of people here, there are always people in the back saying they can't hear what's going on. And, and it really seems to me that people are entitled to come to the city council meetings and hear what's going on. So I don't know what needs to be done to uh, improve the sound system so that uh, all of the discussion from everyone is audible. And I know part of it is speakers need to understand that they need to get right on top of the microphone. But I would like to have some discussion or ask staff to look at what can be done to really make the sound system work for the people who want to hear what's happening in the meetings. I can't hear over here half the time. So I'll just Especially if you face one another, it doesn't come across. Yeah, and, and particularly the, the summer when you have air conditioning and you get that going. I'll just tell you that I agree, and actually my first note that I wrote here was what happened to our sound system overhaul. So we will be on this. Sue texted me about it earlier tonight. We'll be on this first thing in the well, morning. We did talk about moving it closer. Well, there's lots of things we could yeah. do, but I think it, something. it's, it needs to it's something. a constant problem and it needs to be fixed. I would like to put in a plug, even besides this for the sound purposes um, of moving these closer, because in order to be heard, you have to lean over and it's Maybe. really uncomfortable and awkward. We need better mics or different mics, too. I mean, like, we may need to think about I don't want, yeah, I don't want to have to lean. At my conference, they had some really cool mics Can't that do all sound. kinds Can't, of things. Can't hear you. Oh, I was just saying at the conference I was at, there were vendors there with amazingly cool mics that did all kinds of things. Have, uh, oh, Jesus. Give us all Give your mics. Okay. Thank right. you. High priority on the strategic plan. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is something that I, I've um, talked with Bill and Tom about a little bit, um, and given our experience tonight dealing with a city government 100 years ago that didn't quite follow the right paperwork, and now we're trying to resolve it again, um, I wanted to mention to the other counselors that um, we do have a little bit of an unresolved issue with Ledgewood Terrace, um, and there's a number of different issues, but that um, street has not been fully accepted as a city street. Um, it is being maintained by the city, um, and uh, there's there's some other unresolved issues and um, that have meant that it's not been fully accepted um, with regard to ownership, um, and it's certainly a complicated situation. Um, and there hasn't been a sense of urgency about fixing it, um, which I completely understand because we're maintaining it. The you know the property owners don't really have a reason to be upset with us at this point. Um, but I also want to not leave it for people 100 years from now to figure out. <laughs> so I just want to flag that for the rest of you so you're aware of it um, and hope that at some point we can uh, get that resolved. I'm into it. Sweep it up. Take care of that. <laughs> cool. Uh, Glenn. Uh, nothing to say other than I will be at Baguito's tomorrow morning, 8.30 to 9.30. Um, and I look forward to seeing anyone who feels like coming. We've had good turnout the last couple of weeks, and I'm really enjoying it. So thank you. Connor. All right. I'm, I'm picking up a little project they started a few months ago, uh, trying to establish a uh, sort of free walking tour of Montpelier uh, to sort of capture the history and culture of the place. I see it as a real missed opportunity when we have hundreds of buses coming. They step out, take a picture of the State House, and they hop back on the bus. So if we could have a volunteer-driven sort of set, you know, tour of the town where you say, oh, this is a great restaurant, you know, why don't you like pop in here? Um, I think we could do it for free, um, maybe working with the senior center. Uh, but I'd really be interested in talking to people who have good stories or anything about Mont 
let's sexy it up a little bit, you know. Not that it's not sexy, but it's uh, um, a. <laughs> and I, I, I got some great materials from Paul Carnahan and folks who have Are done it in the past. But, um, historical ones. Yeah, but yeah. historical, you know, General Lafayette gave a speech here, this type of stuff. So any input is appreciated on that? I would, I would volunteer to help with that. You'd be a good guy. <laughs> I want to ask Bill if anyone was going to the building of a sense of place. Um, Laura from uh, MDC is, and I'm not sure about Dan Groberg. I can't, but. Um, Dan, okay. I really but, thought it would be good. Yeah, the other one it's, was. Did anyone, one last year was great, but definitely I know for sure Laura's going. And yesterday, did anyone go to the hub, community I hubs? Did, did you? Because I wanted to, and my granddaughter's graduation. The got three through. of us there had a great. Discussion. So you're going to share that with us, because, like I said, the three of us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just the three. Of, oh, oh, too sad. Okay. It was a lovely drive to Hartford, though. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to get back nice to to Ash to Ashley and ourselves about the committee on committees and on social justice, economic justice. If we're going to go ahead with the community workshops in the fall, we got to do some planning this summer. And I didn't know if you were chairing that committee too, but I just put a plug in. Well, it needs to be on the agenda. It needs to be on the agenda. And it also came up, we had our CAB meeting. So I guess I do have something to say. We had our community advisory board meeting for the CJC the other night. Um, and I had to leave a little bit early, but um, I think that there are a number of things Yvonne and I are going to sit down at some point, hopefully pretty soon. Just have to hammer out my work schedule. Um, so that we can kind of put some things together that I've been chatting about for a bit now, a civic discourse cool. forum yes. and yeah. um, a couple of other things that came up uh, as well. So, okay. Cool. Thank you. Just, I, I'm really interested in those. So think of me, please. Yes. Okay, um, so I have a couple of things. Um, one is I want to invite you all to uh, the official opening of the Girton Pocket Park, um, <laughs> which is next Tuesday uh, at five o'clock. There's going to be ice cream and music and just, you know, hanging out in a cool space. Um, so please, uh, you know, if you have time, put it on your calendar, five o'clock next Tuesday. Um, uh, graduation is this Friday, so congratulations to all the graduating seniors. Very exciting. Um, another. Th you, and you guys are all welcome to tickets. And if you yes. don't use them, you're welcome to give them to me. <laughs> sorry. Did I just say that out loud? <laughs> oh, right. I mean, I should have said yes. I'm sorry, Bill. Yeah. Let me know if you need some. Um, uh, so that was one thing. Um, w another uh, item is I did end up getting a chance to. Uh, meet with uh, Phil from the uh, T.W. Wood Gallery. Did I tell you this already? I think the answer is no. I think I've not told you this. Um, he had picked out some art from the from the gallery that uh, he thought m met <coughs> the goals that I had outlined. And so sometime in July, um, this art is going to come down and be switched out for um, some art that just represents different people, um, Good. which I'm pretty excited about. It's black and white, so just prepare yourself, you know, black and white. Um, it doesn't have to be up forever. If we don't no, like and it. that's the goal. We actually even talked about, you know, maybe leaving that up for you know, a, most a year, and then we can look at switching it out again, et cetera. Um, and just want to also point out that there have been some really fun uh, ground breakings and ribbon cuttings lately, like celebrating the opening of Rome and um, Onion River Outdoors. That's exciting. We had a great uh, groundbreaking for Taylor Street. Um, there's some really exciting things happening this summer. And I'm, anyway. I'm, Yay yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it really is great. So um, anyway, just excited about all that. I'm going to miss this art. I guess I'm the only one, but I love these things. <laughs> I come in and look at them sometimes when no one else is around. Well, you've, you've had them. <laughs> you can probably put them in your office. <laughs> oh, there's no space in there now. Um, so uh, what have I got to say? Uh, it sounds like there's m a little more interest on from you all about the non-citizen voting initiative thing. So I'll just let me just tell you where that's at. We're finally, um, been barely busy in the office, but there's finally a meeting of a self you know, an ad hoc, self-defined working group to try to narrow down what some of these 
uh, proposals could look like for a ballot. And it does sound like this, there's probably going to be a special city meeting on the concurrent with the November general election. So probably be working towards putting a charter change on there. And um, there's a few different ways it could go. So I'll, I'll let you all know. But if you're interested, it's 530 uh, ah, next Friday. What is that, the 22nd, I think? Yeah, next Friday, the 22nd. Um, I just mentioned that I found out we were sitting here that I finally got my, in my in my quest to add more letters after my name, I'm now a certified municipal municipal clerk. So it's my CMC to go with my CH and my ADD and all that other stuff. Um, and last thing, if I keep thinking there's going to be some kind of gathering, but I never hear anything. So if I like warmed up the grill in my weird little yard on St. Paul Street and just sent out a date, would you all come? Sure try. Yes. Sure try. Okay. Well, I'll, I will work Bring towards. You some buns. All right. Oh, that's great. It's not a big space, and my house is weird. It's sort of slowly sinking into the ground where the old sewer used to be, but it should be there. Okay. <laughs> Still, What's the attempt to get us to come <laughs> yeah. look at the old? So sewer? okay, I'll get out an email and I'll check with Carrie existence. about a date. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting punchy. I'm I'm well beyond punchy. Okay, I'll try to be brief. Just uh, we do have a hearing with the state on TIF on June 28. I think I've let you know that. We've had some good conversations about the parking garage. Hopefully we'll have something to present to you uh, some point in the near future. And lastly, I did uh, send you out uh, an update on one Taylor and just looking to see if anyone has any objection or has any concerns if we consider the option of selling the parcel that we didn't sell on um, May 15th when we were going to sell it. All for it. So, Go for it. I'm not, you know, we're not committing to it, but I want to make sure that that's a mix because we might need to do that. I just ran into someone downtown uh, today who said, when's the city going to tear down that building? Uh, that's, so, we just I went in it say, today. Hey, we just, we, we haven't Sue, owned it that long. Come Sue on. and Todd and I just went inside it today. <laughs> Take showers afterwards, but no beer. So I bet you it must soon. Smell. Okay, that's all I have. All right, all right. So without objection, we consider the meeting adjourned. Thank you.